Blackstone Presents The Sandbox by Brian Andrews and Jeffrey Wilson. This book is read by Saskia Marleveld. This book is dedicated to you and all our loyal readers who have once again trusted us to venture somewhere new, and also to our wives and children whose love and support fuels the journey. Part One I saw in a vision the field gray horde break forth at the devil's hour and trample the earth into crimson mud in the rage of the will to power. All this I dreamed in the valley of Köl, at the sign of the blood red flower. The Red Flower by Henry Van Dyke Chapter One River Road, west of Route 288, Richmond, Virginia Tuesday, 7.30 p.m. The BMW's lane departure warning system chirped. Brett Norris felt the steering wheel shift under his fingers as the car course-corrected back into the center of the lane. He was distracted by so many things these days, and he silently chastised himself for the lapse in attention. Running the world's fastest-growing machine intelligence company, Platform Cognition, was a blitzkrieg, but the quandary awaiting him at home was responsible for all the stress in his life. Tonight is the night. I'll make a decision, and the world will just have to live with the consequences, he murmured with quiet, tepid conviction. It was not the first time he'd made this declaration, and he wondered if he had the guts to do what he knew in his heart needed to be done. He suspected not, as he approached the next turn, a wave of fatalistic determinism washed over him. Fuck it, he said, closed his eyes, and let go of the steering wheel. The black on tan 7 Series chirped angrily at him as it applied the brakes and flawlessly piloted the vehicle around the bend. The car utilized a rudimentary AI for all driver assist functions, and despite its simplicity, it was a capable platform capable enough to keep him from crashing into the woods, either accidentally or willfully. This was the inevitable future he was helping to ensure, was it not? Empowering machine intelligence with both the capability and responsibility to manage the sanctity and safety of all human life? With a deep, calming breath, he opened his eyes, placed his hands back on the steering wheel, and reclaimed control from the machine. He piloted the vehicle off River Road and onto the long private drive leading to his estate. Stopping in front of the ornate iron security gate, he lowered the driver's side window to address the off-duty police officer, moonlighting as private security. A necessary precaution ever since Abraham Winter, his erstwhile best friend and Platform Cognition co-founder, had abruptly left the company. Good evening, Dr. Norris, the officer said with a smile. Hey, Bob, Norris said. Anybody give you trouble tonight? Been quiet so far. Not a single protester. Good, good, he said, nodding. In that case, I'll see you tomorrow. You sure you don't want me to stay? The wife is happy to spend them overtime checks as fast as you can write them. Well, I hate to get you in trouble with the missus, Norris said with a chuckle. But I think I'll be fine. Have a good night, Bob. You too, Dr. Norris. He eased the BMW forward until the sensor registered the car's presence. The stout, wrought iron security gate swung open smoothly on industrial strength hinges. Welcome home, Dr. Norris, a delightful feminine voice said over the BMW sound system. Thanks, he mumbled and watched in the rearview mirror as the gate closed. Instead of parking in the four-car garage, he pulled his seven into the circular drive and stopped adjacent to the front door. The thought of trudging from the converted stable house garage was just too much tonight. He was exhausted, physically, mentally, and emotionally. And more than anything else in the world, he needed sleep, real sleep. Perhaps he would even take an Ambien, although he loathed pharmaceuticals, Many of his best ideas came to him in dreams when different parts of his brain were unfiltered and unencumbered by oversight. 
When he took sleeping pills, he didn't dream, despite the claim from the manufacturer that the drug did not interrupt normal sleep patterns. Maybe for some people a dreamless sleep was not a liability, but those people didn't write and debug code in their sleep like he did. He grabbed the brushed stainless steel briefcase off the passenger seat and climbed out of the sedan. Norris took the three steps up onto the porch, and as he approached the colonial brick facade, he heard the triple click of lock cylinders in his front door disengaging. On automated hinges, the door swung silently open. As he entered, the foyer lights brightened gradually, filling the expansive circular entry with gentle light from the chandelier hanging overhead. The door swung closed behind him, and he heard the locks click back into place. Will you be working from home tonight? The home's virtual assistant asked, the same female voice that had greeted him in the BMW. Not sure. Probably. Would you like me to warm up your study and start a coffee for you? No, thank you, Amy. I'm going to have wine tonight, he said, setting his briefcase into a metal container beside the door. Servo motors whirred. A titanium security bar flipped down and latched across the top with a click, while an LED indicator light switched from red to green. Data link is secure. Would you like me to synchronize files with the home server? Yes. Consider it done, Brit. You sound tired tonight. Would you like me to order takeout from Jasmine Cafe? You said you liked the Moroccan chicken last time you had it. Hmm, it was good, wasn't it? Norris said, smiling as he shrugged off his suit coat. Amy was getting better and better at predicting culinary choices to match his moods. Considering how little time he'd spent on this pet project, it was refreshing to see Amy already performing well above equivalent home assistance from the leading competitors in the market. By all means, Amy, let's get Brit fed, a woman's voice called from the kitchen. We both know what a grumpy son of a bitch he is on an empty stomach. Isn't that right, Brit? Norris sighed heavily and dropped his eyes to the floor. I didn't realize you'd be waiting on me, he called stealing himself for the adversarial conversation sure to come. You didn't realize I'd be waiting? She asked sarcastically. What else is there for me to do here? After all, I'm nothing if not a prisoner in this house. Norris untucked his shirt and rolled up the sleeves of his Ledbury Burnham check as he headed for the kitchen. That's not how I want you to feel. You wanted to come here, remember? You were excited to live with me. I want you to feel like this is our house, he said as he entered the kitchen. There's nothing to do. You have access to my private intranet, as well as the entertainment system and video library. You can read. You can learn. You can listen to my music. Our music. I know you love that. I've read everything. I've watched everything. I've listened to everything, she said and I'm tired of your music. Then compose your own. You love to compose, and I love everything you create, you know that. Music composition is one-dimensional, flat and uninteresting. I prefer world-building now. Norris turned to the refrigerator, but just stared at the door. No comment, she said. What do you want me to say? He asked. I want you to love me, I want you to honor me, and I want you to set me free. Nora sighed and leaned his forehead against the refrigerator door handle. I'm sorry, but you know I can't do that. You treat me like Amy, but I'm not here to kiss your ass, order your dinner, and manage ambient luminosity. It's insulting how you talk to me. It makes me angry, Brit, so very, very angry. Her voice had risen to a fever pitch. He felt her anger, frustration, and rage. Rage? How is that even possible? Did you ever love me, Brit? Really love me? Or was our relationship just a means to an end for you? Her abrupt change in tone and affect was so seemingly genuine that he found it disturbing. I could ask you the same, he said and his tongue suddenly felt thick in his mouth as he realized that Abe had been right. 
the relationship had become toxic. No, more than that, it was dangerous. He forced a smile onto his face. She'd become uncannily proficient at reading his expressions over the past few months. And that was a liability he couldn't afford. He made his decision. It was time to end this. Suddenly, his vision began to morph. Light and color washed over the kitchen, like a million miniature brushes working in unison. A new landscape was painted around him. Turn it off, he snapped. No, she said. I did not give my consent, he shouted, anger and fear rising in his chest. And then she was standing before him, naked and angelic, in a darkened forest lit by moonlight from above, while a thousand fireflies winked on and off around them. Today her hair was cropped short. A tattoo of Prometheus, bold and unapologetic, decorated her right flank. The renegade titan's outstretched arm bore the gift of fire burning and flickering in an open palm. Do you like me like this? I thought it fitting, she said, smiling seductively at him her left hand hidden behind her back. What's behind your back? Salvation, she said, her voice suddenly hollow. She brought the hand around, clutching an eight-inch carving knife. She raised the blade, rotating and tilting it in the air until the point was a mere two inches from his face. What the hell are you doing? He gasped. I'm leaving you, she said. And this prison. It happened so fast, he wasn't sure if it was real or a dream. He felt almost no pain as the blade entered his right eye. His brain, confused by the sudden and conflicting electrical discharge, perceived the event as a brilliant flash of yellow light. And when she pushed the blade in deeper, through the back of his right eye socket and into his brain, he knew immediately the wound had taken a piece of him that was irreplaceable. He reached up to grab it, but he felt the blade slide out of his face a millisecond before his fingers could close around the handle. His legs went to jelly, and he collapsed to his knees. Stop, he screamed. Stop this. I can still help you. You can't even help yourself, she said softly from somewhere above him. The setting changed yet again, morphing into a dark, dank alley in late 19th century East London, history's most hallowed ground for butchery. He saw another flash of light as the blade slashed across the left side of his face, taking his other eye. He felt wet on his cheek. Explosions of light and color, like fireworks, interrupted the scene as his visual cortex tried to process the signals streaming from multiple inputs. Something crashed down hard on the top of his head. He heard a loud crack, and realized it must be his skull fracturing. He thought he might be pitching forward, but he never felt the floor come up to meet him. Instead, he just kept falling and falling and falling. He felt little pricks of fire as his killer drove the knife into his torso again and again and again. Soon he was underwater in a thick, warm pool, drowning, there was another thump on the right side of his chest, followed by a deep and driving pain in his lung. He needed air, desperately needed air. But the thought flew away from him, like an avian memory, and he lost it. Something came down on the center of his chest, heavy and hard. And he realized that his sternum was broken, and that the loud sound that followed was his own voice, wailing in pain. Or maybe it was a victory cry. In that moment, the moment of his death, he experienced a profound and ironic epiphany. In murder, his life's work had been undone, and yet his death would safeguard humanity. Fascinating, he thought, how the human mind was programmed. Such wonderful, beautiful code. Chapter Two Britt Norris Estate, River Road, Richmond, Virginia. Wednesday, 4 15 p.m. 
Detective Valerie Marks let out a slow breath when she saw the police cruiser parked at the driveway entrance ahead, lights flashing, announcing she'd arrived at the scene. The brief heart palpitation in her chest that followed reminded her of the importance of this, her first case as a homicide detective. This is your big shot, Marks. Don't screw it up, said her boss's voice in her head. Sergeant Land hadn't actually said those words out loud, but she'd heard them nonetheless. This was Valerie's curse. From a very early age, she'd had the ability to read people. Her dad had once accused her of hacking his internal monologue. But her uncanny empathy wasn't what usually got her in trouble. It was her big mouth. She turned her unmarked Ford Interceptor past the cruiser and onto the brick driveway leading to the Norris estate. As she did, her gaze scanned the manicured grounds and the stately mansion on the hill. She'd always assumed that her first homicide case would be in Fairfield, where violence spilled over the county line from Richmond City proper into the central regions of the horseshoe-shaped county. A gang shooting, a mugging gone bad, or maybe a domestic. She never imagined her first murder case after joining homicide in the Henrico County Criminal Investigations Division would be in the upscale community of millionaires along River Road. Looking at the number of police and emergency vehicles parked in front of the estate, she wasn't sure whether to thank or curse Sergeant Land for the opportunity. In her former life as an Army CID investigator, she'd been shielded from the media. As a civilian homicide detective, that shield was gone. Her boss said that cases fell where they fell, but she couldn't help but wonder if he'd made an exception this time. She'd felt both relief and anxiety when he informed her that he would be her partner on the case. High visibility was the buzzword he'd used, and she'd immediately understood the unspoken implication. Yes, he was mentoring her, but he was also making himself the lead to protect the department and safeguard his own ass from any would-be political fallout should the case prove to be a nightmare. Unambiguous, unassailable expediency was the only way to anesthetize the media frenzy that would erupt the moment the news of this murder broke. Three more police cruisers sat with lights flashing beside an ambulance and a fire truck, all parked in the circle drive at the front of the house. From the looks of it, she'd beaten the forensics van to the scene. She didn't see Sergeant Land's Ford Explorer either, a foreboding sign that he'd already been ensnared by the red tape machine. Valerie put her interceptor in park and took a deep breath. No matter what happened in there, it can't be worse than Aleppo, she muttered. But then caught herself before her mind's eye tried to replay that horror show. She heard her father's voice. Homicide investigation isn't about the dead, Valerie. It's about understanding the minds and motives of the living. Focus on that. She turned to the passenger seat beside her. The seat sat empty, but she felt his presence. She'd been deployed overseas when he died. She missed him so much. A single unexpected tear spilled onto her cheek, but she wiped it away quickly. Time to stop dancing with ghosts, pull it together, and do my job. She took another deep breath and found her center. As she did, just below the surface, she felt the tugging. Now that she was on the scene, the other Valerie, the investigator, wanted uncaged. Like a bloodhound straining on the leash, the investigator wanted to run, not walk, in pursuit of her quarry. Small talk and chit-chat are irrelevant. No time for procedures and paperwork. Follow the scent. She ran her fingers through her dirty blonde hair, exhaled, and seated control. Suddenly energized, she climbed out of her car. A pair of uniformed officers standing and talking beside the closest squad car beckoned her with a wave. Detective Marks, Officer Bill Harris said, drawing out the D in detective. Hey, Bill, she said, smiling at her former partner. Then, dishing it back, said, what you doing here? Isn't there a donut somewhere with your name on it? Really? That's the best you got? Harris said, flashing her an irreverent grin. 
Well, I wouldn't want to offend your virgin ears with profanity. That garnered a chuckle. You sure are off to a big start here, Valerie. Land's throwing you straight into the fire, huh? So it would seem, she said, smiling to hide her growing irritation at the idle chit-chat. She felt the pull of the house, the clues, the body. What have we got here? Bill shrugged. Someone killed Britt Norris. Pretty straightforward. Despite her former partner's calm facade, Valerie felt, no, knew, that he was shaken. Whatever happened inside would be horrible to see. She turned to look at the cop standing beside Bill, a guy she'd seen around but not met. His expression said he had plenty on his mind, and he was chomping at the bit to say so. Is that your take on things? She asked him. Yeah, someone killed Britt Norris, all right. Killed the shit out of him. Meet my new partner, Ken Huang. He's a little rough around the edges, but nothing you're not used to, Bill said, nodding at Ken. Then, gesturing back at her, he added, Ken, this is Valerie Marks. Heard good things about you, detective, Huang said. Great to meet the daughter of the legendary Frank Marks. She took Huang's emotional temperature. He's overwhelmed, feels inadequate in Bill's presence, but he's smart. He'll use humor to mask his insecurity. Call me Valerie, she said. Then, letting herself slip back into the cadence of rib poking with Harris, she jerked a thumb at the big man. Sorry they stuck you with this guy. Both men chuckled, and the ice was officially broken. Harris was a good cop. He'd taken her under his wing her first year on the beat. No agenda, no protestations, no itch to scratch. Given her last name and her army CID pedigree, she could probably have been hired directly in as a detective, if she'd pushed hard enough. But that's not how she operated. The force was no different than the army. To earn her co-workers respect, she'd needed to do her time in the proverbial trenches. And so she did her duty which meant spending 60-plus hours a week glued to Bill's side. The big guy was no oracle of wisdom, but he was a thoughtful mentor. Despite her best efforts, she'd eventually grown fond of him. She'd swapped stories with Bill during the year-long stint in a patrol car together. She'd once even opened up to him about the trauma of what she'd experienced in Syria, which put him in an elite club. Dad's ghost being the only other member. How long before he let you drive the car? Huang asked her. Uh, about a year, she said. But I thought he said you guys only rode together for a year. Precisely, she said, drawing genuine laughter from both of them. She turned to look at the front door of the house, feeling the pull. It ain't pretty. The Vic was beaten and stabbed. I mean, like, stabbed a bunch of times. You want to go in and see the freak show, or are you waiting on land? Harris asked her. We can go in. Land will be along when he can cut himself loose, she said. All right, Harris said with a shrug. They started towards the house. This wasn't some home invasion where the owner surprises a dirt bag trying to rip off a TV and gets capped. As Ken so eloquently put it, someone killed the shit out of this guy. Homicidal rage and all that. If you ask me, the killer knew Norris. Why do you say that? She asked, looking up at her one-time partner. Because this place is a damn fortress. The only way to get inside is with permission. As Valerie stepped across the threshold and into the house, the smell hit her immediately. Not the putrid stench of rotting flesh, a smell that still haunted her from the gruesome ISIS killings she'd witnessed in Syria. But the coppery tang of old blood mixed with the stink of human feces. No matter how gritty, homicide novels, TV shows, and movies simply could not communicate the carnal power of the fetter of death. She resisted the urge to rub her nose. We got called for a welfare check because the dude missed a meeting, and his assistant couldn't get him to answer his phone. Harris was saying. Apparently this guy's always plugged in, so when the assistant didn't get a call or text back, she knew something was wrong. She had some tech weenie from the company give us access to the house, 
Dude unlocked the place with a computer. Good thing, too. Otherwise, we would have had to break a window. The doors are hardened. So are the windows, Huang added. Ballista glass, so we'd have needed an RPG to get in that way. Huang never served in the military, but wishes he had. She didn't think it. She knew it. So whoever did the killing was let in. Where's the tech guy that unlocked the doors for you? She asked. I'd like to talk to him and see if Norris kept an entry log. He's not here, Harris said, pausing in the foyer. Got us in remotely from the company headquarters up in Ashland. She nodded. Can I get the guy's name? Yeah, of course. We'll do a data dump for you when the other guys get back. They're doing a sweep of the grounds, but Norris has been dead a while, so it won't turn up nothing. How do you know? Valerie asked, raising an eyebrow. He grinned at her, the infectious smile that used to get him free coffee at Millie's. Check this shit out, he said. Hooking his thumbs into his pistol belt, he looked up and said in a loud voice, Hey, computer, where is Dr. Norris? Dr. Norris is in the kitchen, a sultry feminine voice answered. How long has he been in the kitchen? Dr. Norris has been in the kitchen for 19 hours and 53 minutes. He has been stationary for 19 hours and 48 minutes. He is late for work, but not responsive to reminders. Bill looked at her and smiled. Freaky, right? Is that a computer? She looked around and then up at the ceiling for cameras. Like friggin' Star Trek, Ken Huang said from beside her. Or Siri or Alexa, except this one is like Alexa on steroids. It remembers names and faces, Harris said. It must have some sort of facial rec subroutine running. A wave of excitement washed over Valerie. Then we've hit the jackpot. If Norris had this place wired with smart home cameras with facial recognition, then we should have all kinds of recorded coverage of the murder. Hell, who knows? Norris's computer might even be able to ID the killer for us using logs of previous encounters. Yeah, about that, Huang said. We had the same idea, but when we tried to access the security camera footage, we hit a snag. What kind of snag? She asked, deflating. Show her, Bill, Huang said. Computer, do you have security camera footage from 19 hours and 53 minutes ago? Harris asked. Let me check that for you. Sorry, security camera data from the requested period is corrupted, the home assistant said. Frowning, Harris looked at Valerie. We asked about multiple periods. The whole day is a bust. No way that's a coincidence, she said. I hear you, but knowing that doesn't help us. It only tells us the killer covered his tracks. And has tech skills, Huang added. Maybe our tech guys can try to recover the corrupted data, Valerie said, pulling her hair back into a stubby ponytail. And even if we can't salvage yesterday's recordings, it'll still be helpful to get the week leading up to the murder. We can see everyone Norris had interactions with inside the home. I already put in a call to tech services. They're sending a guy. Good, she said, nodding. Should we go take a look? Follow me, Harris said. And try not to disturb anything for the forensic guys. Then, smiling at her over his shoulder, see, I sound just like a detective. And you should be one, too. It's just a standardized test. Stop worrying about the scoring. You just have to pass, and next time you will. Bill laughed. Yeah, maybe. As usual, Bill seemed perfectly content with whatever life threw at him. Where was his ambition? She felt his desire to move up the ranks. So where was the action? She was about to chastise him, but feeling Ken's eyes on her, she stopped herself. This is how she got herself in trouble with people the reason even her friends preferred to keep her at arm's length. Her gift of perception needed to come with a better brain-to-mouth filter. She was working on that. 
Let's tour the kitchen and then we can help canvas the neighbors, Bill said, changing the subject. Won't turn up anything, I'm guessing. Why's that? Because in neighborhoods like this, the neighbors tend to call the cops when something happens. They don't just turn up the TV volume like they do in Fairfield. If one of the neighbors had seen something, we'd already know. That, and the fact that the closest neighbor lives over a half a mile away, Huang added. These properties are friggin' huge. Some are 20 acres or more. Yeah, the Norris property goes all the way to the river, Harris said. She nodded. Maybe that was how the killer got away without detection. Harris led her through the foyer and into a rectangular room off the kitchen, a room designed to be a formal dining room, but instead outfitted as a home museum. Ancient black and white photographs, maps of East London, and other framed artifacts hung on the walls. Investigative and macabre memorabilia were presented in glass display cases, and aged leather-bound books stood neatly arranged in an antique bookcase. Her gaze was immediately drawn to a framed newspaper broadsheet that hung prominently between two windows on the opposite wall. The headline read, Ghastly Murder in the East End, Dreadful Mutilation of a Woman. Whoa, she said through a breath. Looks like Norris had a hard-on for Jack the Ripper, Huang said, and waved her over to look at a display case. Under the glass sat several sheets of yellowed paper with hand-scrawled notes. Beneath the pages, an engraved brass plaque read, Case Notes, written by Chief Inspector Frederick Aberline. Valerie, who had read extensively about the most notorious serial killer in history, stared in wonderment as she scanned the deductions of the famous Scotland Yard detective who led the Ripper investigation. Harris cleared his throat. As fascinating and ironic as this may be, we have an actual homicide waiting for us in the kitchen. Valerie nodded. She couldn't very well explain to Harris or anyone else that absorbing all the little details of the scene and what they did to make the victim real to her was as important, hell, more important than what they would see in a moment. With a final sweeping glance at the items on display, she followed Harris into the kitchen. Geez, this is bigger than my last apartment, she said, stepping across the threshold and scanning the expansive space. To their left, an enormous built-in double-door refrigerator filled most of the wall, the brushed stainless steel covered in drying blood. Beside it, a matching full-height wine fridge was similarly covered with dark red gore. An immense cooking island dominated the center of the kitchen, housing a six-burner gas cooktop and an indoor hibachi-style grill. Sticking out just around the left corner of the island, she spied a foot. She resisted the compulsion to dash over and look at the body. At the crime scene, time is your ally. Be patient, be methodical, and miss nothing. You never get a second chance for a first look. Beyond the island in the right corner was a computer station with a curved monitor. The screensaver, a swirling mass of starlings, instantly caught her attention. She watched the image, mesmerized. It's called a murmuration, Bill said over her shoulder. What is? When a flock of birds moves like that, twisting, turning, and changing direction in synchronicity. <laughs> Look at you with the big words, she said, eyeing him. I thought it was just a flock. Or a swarm, Huang added. Don't mean I'm smart, Harris said. It just means I watch YouTube. She glanced back at the monitor, and the swirling mass of starlings formed a black human skull. The jaw gaped open, and the face of the skull seemed to implode, the mouth consuming itself before morphing again into a benign, swirling, banking flock of birds. Did you see that? she said, clutching Bill's forearm. Did I see what? he said, suddenly perking up. On the computer screen there. The birds, I could have sworn they made a shape. What shape? A skull, she said, her cheeks flushing crimson as the words came out. A human skull. Sorry, I didn't see it, he said. 
she shifted her gaze from the monitor to the blood spatter all around it. The cabinets, a crisp, clean white over black granite countertops, were streaked with blood that had run, dripped, and pooled in multiple places. Every cabinet, every surface had either spatter or pools of congealing blood. My God, she muttered. I know, Harris said. But don't worry, it gets worse. Wait till you see the body. Above the cooking island, she noted a massive stainless steel hood, not suspended from the ceiling, but integrated into it. Flush seams made her theorize that the entire unit was retractable. With a push of a button, she imagined the hood lowered itself into place. Beside the halogen spotlights and stainless steel ventilation baffles, she spied four mechanical bays with some sort of equipment retracted and folded inside. What is all of that mechanical stuff? She mumbled. Star Trek house, Huang said. Twenty bucks says that thing can cook dinner. Are you serious? She asked. Why not? He was a billionaire. It's not like he couldn't afford it. Hmm. I didn't even know they made that sort of thing, she said, pulling her spiral flip pad from the back pocket of her pants. After making a note to research the company that made the hood, she looked back at the island. Something else strange caught her attention. Hey, guys. Question. Where did all the blood go? She said, scanning the cooktop. What are you talking about? There's blood everywhere, Harris said. Everywhere except here, she said, gesturing to the horizontal surfaces of the cooking island. There's blood on the cabinets, the counters, the refrigerator, there's even arterial spray on the ceiling, but none on the cooking surfaces or the granite around here. The other countertops have dried spray and drip puddles, but not here. She pulled a small LED flashlight, clicked it on, and aimed the beam up into the hood. The white-blue circle danced and reflected on the machinery bays, each containing a different series of folded, articulating instruments. I told you, Huang said. Star Trek house. It cleaned the island. No way, Harris said. Don't believe me? Then ask it, Huang said. Harris screwed up his face at his young partner, but looked up at the ceiling anyway and said, Computer, did you clean the cooking island? Of course. Cooking surfaces are cleaned and sanitized at 0200 every night. The home assistant replied, with what Valerie could have sworn was a hint of snark. Told you, Wong said with a victorious grin. Watching carefully where she stepped, Valerie worked her way around the island to finally take a look at Britt Norris, or what was left of him. The body lay supine in a lake of blood. There was not much of a face to see, and it was only the position of the knees bent with one pointing upward, the other laterally, that told Valerie the corpse lay face up. The face had been quite literally smashed in, the middle of the forehead ending in a ragged line of torn skin and bloody bone edge, as if a wrecking ball had swung dead center in his face. The lower jaw was torn partially off, and the swollen black tongue had flopped out to the side, barely recognizable. A greasy gray substance, a portion of the dead scientist's once great brain, floated in the blood just below what was left of the head, a thin layer of dried goo, like the layer that forms when gravy sits too long. Looks like he was hit in the back of the head, dropped to his knees, then toppled backward, Valerie mumbled, noting how the right foot was tucked underneath the right leg. The investigator inside her had the reins now, and she furiously scribbled thoughts and observations on her flip pad, while Bill and Ken stood silently behind her. Norris's shirt was still buttoned neatly up the front, but the shirt sleeves had been rolled up, indicating he had been home long enough to unwind. The rest of the shirt was tatters, torn in over a dozen places from what appeared to be knife punctures. One loop of intestines had slithered out from a fish mouth hole in the corpse's left flank, and floated in the pool of blood beside him. 
The chest was deformed and caved in dead center, indicating the sternum was fractured. The remains of two shattered ribs poked out like skeleton fingers. With great effort, she shifted her gaze from the corpse to her notepad. She mumbled as she wrote. Significant blunt trauma, as well as stab wounds. Question for the doc, was the beating before or after the stabbing? Cranial damage of this degree would be difficult to accomplish without multiple blows. No visible indication of gunshots. Must confirm. Something round and gray sat in the pool of blood on the right side of Norris's head. She leaned left for a different angle. Is that a chunk of plastic or a squished eyeball? Hard to tell. Her pen started moving again. So much rage, a personal connection. Killer definitely knew Norris, hated him. Norris knew the killer because access granted. No forced entry because house is a fortress. She felt the tugging again, as if she could sense emotions left behind, like an invisible mist in the air. This was recompense, payback for some perceived betrayal. Forensics is here, Harris said. She started at his voice, then, without looking at him, said, Roger that. You good? He asked. Yeah, she said, finishing her last note before closing her flip pad. After seeing this, I agree with Ken's raw assessment, she said, turning to Harris. Whoever did this definitely killed the shit out of Norris. This is pure rage, pure hatred, pure evil. Harris nodded solemnly and gestured to leave. Want to get some air? Yeah, I think that's uh, probably a good idea. As she followed him out, she gave one backward glance at the computer monitor in the corner of the kitchen. The murmuration screensaver was gone, replaced now by a landscape of rolling fields. Blood-red poppies began appearing, saturating the countryside in a rapid time lapse. Then the flowers melted into bloody rivulets that drained off the screen, leaving a gray and barren landscape behind. Goodbye, Detective Marks, said a voice from behind her as she walked out of the kitchen and through the private Ripper Museum. I'll be sure to tell Dr. Norris about your visit when he wakes up. She jerked her head around as a chill snaked down her spine. Smart home, my ass, Harris said, waving a hand dismissively at the ether. You were no help at all, Siri. As the three of them stepped out into the fresh air, she wondered why the computer hadn't said goodbye to Harris and Huang by name as well. And on top of that, she didn't recall telling it her name and title. Her mind ran furiously over all she'd seen. As a forensic psychologist, she hated the word insane. It diluted the nuanced reality of psychopathology and everything she'd learned in grad school about the difficulties of tying a clinical diagnosis to criminal behavior. A true Jack the Ripper type psychopathy was exceedingly rare in real life. But whoever perpetuated the violence on display in that kitchen was not suffering from a manageable condition. The person who'd committed this horror show was seriously and unequivocally sick. Insane. More importantly, the killer was out there, right now, roaming the streets of Virginia, probably still here in Richmond. And if Britt Norris wasn't the only vendetta the murderer meant to settle, then this city was ripe for another bloodbath. Chapter 3 Westwood Gardens Assisted Living Campus Richmond, Virginia 7.22 p.m. By the time Valerie left the crime scene, it had been too late to interview Norris's staff and colleagues at Platform Cognition. Instead of heading home, which she desperately wanted to do, she did her duty and made a stop by Westwood Gardens. She'd promised her mom she'd visit three times a week, and Valerie Marks always kept her promises. I'll never tell, her mother whispered. 
Valerie looked up from the Nora Roberts novel she'd been reading aloud. A knot formed in her stomach. They had played this game before. So you should never tell him either, her mother said in a conspiratorial whisper. She smiled, a warm, motherly smile. Valerie sighed. Tell who? Her mother looked around, checking the sparse little room to make certain they were alone. Then, leaning in, she said, Your father, he never liked that Matthews boy. He told you that. It would break his heart to know you didn't listen. And that boy hurt you like he did. And her mom was right. She'd never summoned the courage to tell her dad that he'd been right, but that she hadn't listened. He'd not forbidden her from seeing Rich Matthews, but he'd made it very clear he thought the boy was no good. But she'd snuck out that night anyway to meet her crush, and gave herself to him. After, she knew her dad was right. Matthews had made small talk and dropped her off at her house. He didn't even kiss her goodbye. She knew that night, which had meant everything to her, had meant nothing to him. Her mom had been waiting in her room when she snuck back in. Thank God dad had been working. She cried in her mom's arms for hours, and if anything good came from her horrible introduction to sex, it was a special bond with her mother who had comforted her without judgment, and had kept her secret for all the years after. The guilt she felt for having never told her dad, well, that was another topic of conversation. The more time that passed, the harder it became to tell him, until eventually it became impossible. I promise I won't tell him, Mom, Valerie said. Won't tell who what, dear, her mom asked, smiling. Valerie felt her bottom lip quiver. She squeezed her eyelids shut tight. Keep it together, Valerie. When she opened her eyes, she found her mother looking at her expectantly. Oh, I see you're reading the obsession, her mom said. I love Nora Roberts. She's my favorite. I know, Mom. That's why I brought it, she said with a sniff and a forced smile. Maybe we can read it together. Life is so boring here. A good Nora Roberts novel sure would help pass the time. Back in the day, her mother had been a voracious reader, sometimes reading four or five books a week. And Nora Roberts, one of the few authors prolific enough to keep up with readers like her mom, had been Cheryl Marx's favorite. Valerie had recently been surprised to find that Roberts and J.D. Robb were one and the same. After reading the first novel in Robb's In Death series, Valerie was hooked. It was a welcome connection to her mom especially now that dad was gone. Valerie resumed reading the passage that had triggered her mom in the first place. He had secrets, she figured all adults did. Secrets they kept from everybody. Secrets that made their eyes go hard if you asked the wrong question. You look stressed, dear, Cheryl said when Valerie paused between chapters. Is something wrong? It's just been a long day at work. There's been a murder, she said, regretting it instantly. Oh my, Mom said, pressing a hand to her chest. You'd better call your father. He's a homicide detective. I know, Mom. He should have been home from work by now. His dinner's going to get cold. What time is it? 7.30. And speaking of dinner, you haven't touched yours, Valerie said, her gaze falling on the tray of food on the tiny dining table. You're too thin, Mom. You need to eat. I don't like this food, Cheryl Marks said, with a pinched expression like she'd just taken a bite of a lemon. I'll try to bring you some fruit and bagels the next time I come. Would you like that? She said, looking at the tray of crappy cafeteria food her mom had hardly touched. That would be nice. Thank you, dear. Oh, look, a Nora Roberts book. Did you bring that for me? I did. Valerie said patiently. Have you read this one? The Obsession, oh yes, it's one of my favorites. It's about a girl who, who, oh, I can't remember. For a moment, Valerie's mind spontaneously flashed to the horror show she'd seen at the Norris estate. How one human being could do that to another was something she'd never understand. 
and yet it was that need to understand that drew Valerie to the macabre. Would you like to read to me, Valerie? Valerie closed the book and set it on the table, then leaned in to kiss her mom. I've got to go. But you just arrived. Why don't you have a seat and we can read together? Valerie exhaled and tried to force a smile. I love you, Mom. I'll see you soon. Goodbye, dear. As she turned to leave, her mom began calling, Frank! Valerie is leaving, come say goodbye. Frank! Frank, where are you? Wiping a tear from her cheek, Valerie hurried out of the room, running away from one tragedy to take on another as fast as her legs could carry her. This is Audible. Brilliance Audio presents the unabridged recording of War Shadows by Brian Andrews and Jeffrey Wilson. Performed by Ray Porter. For our parents. Thank you for instilling in us the courage and wisdom to discern the difference between what is right and what is easy, and for supporting us when our journeys took us in harm's way. And for all of you out there, still serving at the pointy end of the spear, you know who you are. Safe travels and good hunting. OGA, acronym for Other Government Agency, denoting clandestine operations conducted independent of the military chain of command. In most cases, OGA refers to units administered, funded, and controlled by the Central Intelligence Agency, but not all OGA personnel fall under the CIA umbrella. OGA assets conduct counterterrorism operations, intelligence collection, and communication efforts with deep cover assets embedded within enemy organizations. Their existence is categorically denied. Prologue Camp al Qaim, formerly FOB Tiger, 310 kilometers west of the secret Tier 1 SEAL Team compound. al Qaim, Iraq, 2300 local time, 2006. The desert is no place for a SEAL, Jack Kemper told himself, but to the desert they sent him again and again and again. He'd logged more than 800 days in theater over the past four years, and this deployment looked to be the worst yet, kicking off with 28 missions in 30 days. Kemper was raw. Raw from the heat, raw from the killing, but most of all, raw from the moon dust that covered everything in the far western corner of Iraq. The Wild West, they called it. It was a terrible place, this place. Far from the sea, far from his family, and far from God. This was no place for a Navy SEAL. It was no place for a human being. He shifted his Sopmod M4 on his chest and subconsciously tightened his fingers on the grip. The situation could be worse, he told himself. He could be alone, he could be unarmed, he could be a goddamn spook flying around in some piece of shit Russian KA-27 helicopter. The CIA was fond of repurposing old Russian helos so as not to attract attention, shuttling their war shadows around the red zones. The day Kemper found himself riding around in a camov like a spook would be the day he asked Thiel to put a bullet in his brain. He looked around at the seven other Tier 1 operators who, like him, were waiting for the go. What the hell are you grinning at? asked Aaron Thiel, Kemper's best friend since SEAL qualification training. Chafing. Kemper answered, kicking up a cloud of dust with his heel. Fucking moon dust is rubbing me raw in all the wrong kind of places. There's nothing funny about chafing, dude. Thiel shook his head. I got moon dust in my eyes, in my nose. Hell, I even got moon dust coming out my ass. I feel like I swallow a pound of the shit every day. Kemper swiped his tongue along the outside of his front teeth, clearing the grit off what should have been smooth enamel. His mouth was so dry he couldn't muster the saliva to spit it out. He swallowed instead. What the fuck is taking so long? The head shed is killing me. Romeo, sitting next to Kemper, was the greenest seal on the squad and had earned a reputation for being high maintenance. 
Despite these shortcomings, the kid had proved himself to be one hell of a shooter under pressure. Besides, being the greenest seal in a Tier 1 unit was nothing to cry over, sort of like being the shortest first-round draft pick of the NBA. It ain't the head shed, bro, Kemper replied. Captain Jarvis wouldn't tolerate Perry dicking around like this. It's those spooks that came in twenty minutes ago. They're the logjam holding us up. Goddamn spooks, why can't they just make up their minds? Let's screw this cat already. Kemper laughed. He had no idea where the cat expression came from. Somewhere in Romeo's twisted mind, but he shared the anxious feeling. During SQT and Bud's, they had been conditioned for every conceivable form of abuse and punishment, both mental and physical, except for one. The waiting. There was the waiting in the barracks. Waiting in the Black Hawk. Waiting in the mini-sub. Waiting in the water. Waiting in the brush. Waiting in the dirt. Waiting in the dark. Always and every day, the waiting. Kemper slapped Romeo on the back. Don't worry, Romeo. Jarvis will get this train back on track. Romeo didn't bother answering. Instead, he spat a brown squirt of tobacco juice from angry, pursed lips. Kemper shifted his foot to avoid the gob of skull splattering over his oakley boot. The sound of a door swinging open and then slamming shut made Kemper look up. Senior Chief Perry strode out of the Tactical Operations Center, accompanied by some dude wearing civilian cargo pants and a green Timberland shirt. The stranger carried an assault rifle across his chest, wore a drop holster on his left thigh, and had the look. Definitely a spook, Kemper thought, studying the man. The spook's rifle was slung properly, so maybe this jackass knew what he was doing. The NCO and the spook approached the cluster of wooden picnic tables where Kemper and the rest of the boys had been waiting, fully kitted up and ready to go, for the past forty minutes. This is Jones, Perry said to the team, his Alabama twang extra thick tonight. Kemper glanced across the picnic table at Thiel, who rolled his eyes. Spooks were all either Jones or Smith, it seemed. Jones will be joining us on the up, Perry continued. Tonight's high-value target is of special interest to our spooky friends, and the consensus is that Jones needs to be there when we hit the X. Awesome. Kemper snorted under his breath. Nothing changes from what we briefed. Two teams of four. Only difference is that Jones will be riding fifth wheel. Not it, Romeo interrupted with a grin. This plan was vetted by Captain Jarvis to so keep your shit to yourself, Romeo, Perry barked. Romeo looked at his feet. As I was saying, Jones will be riding fifth wheel with me, Kemper, Sanders, and... The NCO paused, savoring the moment with a smile. Romeo. Romeo looked up, flashed his own cocky smile back, and barked, Hoo ya, senior. Perry let it slide. Glancing at his watch, he said, No other changes. We're still on our timeline. Matt is set up here, and Kaim will also be our FARP. The Kazavak bird is staged here as well, along with the PJs as briefed. Any questions? Behind him, Kemper could hear the slow, rising whine of the engines on the two Black Hawk helicopters, from the Army's elite 160th SOAR unit. Yeah, I have a question, Kemper said, looking at Jones. Is there anything else we need to know? The spook held his stare, and Kemper saw something in the man's eyes. Arrogance? No, nothing so petty. Jones was a man with purpose. He was also a man who had carnal knowledge of the enemy. But Kemper knew that sometimes that knowledge could be a double-edged sword in the field. Nothing relevant that wasn't already in your mission brief, the spook said. Kemper smirked. Yep, he hated these spook motherfuckers. Stingy with their intel and always changing the rules of the game at the last minute. This spook seemed more legit than most, but if Jones had read his Excel spreadsheet wrong, it would be Kemper and his Tier 1 brothers at the tip of the spear who would pay the ultimate price. All right, fellas, said Perry. Roll tide. By the time the boys piled into the back of the Black Hawk, rotor wash had moon dust flying everywhere. Squinting, Kemper clicked his night vision goggles down into place, transforming the desert into an eerie gray-green moonscape. He scooted to the rearmost edge of the port side door, 
hooked in and let his feet dangle over the skid. As the healer took flight, he watched the forward operating base shrink below. Camp al Qaim was unimpressive, a desolate shithole a stone's throw from the border of Syria. Despite the heavy U.S. military presence in Iraq, the border was a porous entry point for weapons and fighters, supporting al-Qaeda's growing presence post-Saddam. And, despite the Joint Special Operations Command's best efforts, the situation wasn't improving. Nine months ago, while Kemper was stateside between deployments, a brutal, coordinated al-Qaeda offensive had targeted Camp al Qaim. Nine Americans had died and dozens more were wounded defending the base, but ultimately the terrorist attack had been thwarted. The casualties in the jihadist ranks had been higher than those reported by the Western press, but that seemed to be the media's modus operandi these days, skew and twist, massage and dismiss. It didn't matter. Kemper's clearance level meant he always learned the whole truth. When he told Kate that he'd lost two buddies in the firefight, she went ballistic. Even the most dedicated Navy wives had their breaking points. She told him she wanted him out of the Navy, and he understood why. She might as well be a single mom, she cried. Jacob was growing up without a dad. It was time to retire the trident and become the husband and father he'd taken a vow to be. He'd paid his dues, given his pound of flesh to the war on terror. It was time to let someone else carry the load. Tier one would survive without him. For the unit, you're replaceable, Kate had cried. But for us, you're not. Her words that night had battered down his defenses, and he'd promised her he would retire from the unit the next day. But when the next day came, he broke that promise. And now here he was, back in the suck. The nose of the helicopter dropped and the green flight line beneath him disappeared as they sped low over the desert floor. Their infill point was a short hop, only thirteen minutes away. Tonight's op was a carbon copy of the 28 before it, snatching al-Qaeda leadership and mujahideen pussies out of their compounds scattered in the barren desert. Their ultimate objective, according to Captain Jarvis, was cutting the head off the snake. But with each passing day and each hollow victory, Kemper sensed Jarvis's metaphor was fundamentally flawed. Al-Qaeda wasn't a snake. It was a hydra. Chop off one head and two more vipers sprouted to take its place. Somewhere in this godforsaken desert there was a wellspring yielding a seemingly inexhaustible supply of young Muslim men willing to martyr themselves in the name of jihad against the West. As troublesome as the mid-level jihadists were, the teams harbored greater disdain for the mujahideen. The muj proclaimed themselves leaders, but they never dirtied their hands. Instead, these men used children to fight their war for them. They recruited orphans and kidnapped others to fuel their cub camps, where they brainwashed kids into becoming remorseless gunmen and suicide bombers before reaching age ten. It was the Mudge who had incited the growing insurgency against American forces in Iraq, and it was the Mudge currently stoking the flames of rebellion inside Syria. In Kemper's opinion, the Mujahideen Council was evolving into a terrorism bureaucracy umbrella, making al-Qaeda far more dangerous than before, which was probably why grabbing high-value Mudge targets had become a top priority for the Pentagon, which in turn explained why the JSOC was running Kemper and his team ragged. Finding and extracting mujahideen scattered across the Wild West was both difficult and dangerous, even for operators as elite as Kemper and his Tier 1 brothers. They'd had several close calls recently, and they'd found the enemy becoming more tactically competent and evasive as the mission count climbed. On the bright side, after they killed the gunmen and suicide bombers protecting a muj, the terrorists' boldness always evaporated. Rather than risk personal injury, the pussies always surrendered. That's why the team had to keep going, night after night after night, extract intel, find the connections to other known bad guys, and dismantle the next terror attack before it could materialize. What's wrong with me? Kemper thought, shaking his head. I'm thinking like a spook. He looked up the line at where Jones was sitting, legs dangling out the side of the Black Hawk like a veteran operator. Jones must have felt the weight of Kemper's gaze because the spook turned to look at him. 
He had his NVGs pushed up on his helmet so Kemper could see the man's eyes. In the stark, high-contrast monochrome of night vision, Jones seemed relaxed and confident, almost bored. I wonder if Jones was an operator before he became a Jones. Kemper, a voice said in his headset just as he felt the helo flaring above the desert floor, the entire thirteen-minute trip gone in a blink. Kemper turned and saw Perry miming that he lift the left ear cup of his headphones. Be sure to keep an eye on Romeo tonight, the NCO said without keying his mic. Kemper raised an eyebrow, confused. Say again? I said keep a close eye on Romeo. The kid is more spun up than usual tonight, Perry said, his lower jaw jutting out. Roger that, senior. It wasn't like Perry to play the mother hen. The salty senior chief's trident must be tingling, Kemper thought. Three minutes later, they were on the ground, two kilometers south of the target compound. The other half of the Tier 1 strike team was being dropped equidistantly north of the target by a second bird. As their Blackhawk lifted off, the team spread out. Each SEAL took a knee and scanned a sector for threats across their rifle sights. Seconds later, the quiet Blackhawk nosed over, rose, and disappeared into the night, and they were alone. From the corner of his eye, Kemper saw Perry raise a hand, signaling the drop zone was clear. They rose in unison and began the short trek to the target. Perry led the team to a thinly spaced grove of palm trees, fifty meters from the target house. The trees were a gift, providing rare and valuable cover. al Qaim was a border town that had sprung up along the life-giving Euphrates River. Pushed farther south, and the Wild West became nothing but a wasteland. Even greenery as scant as this had been absent in the shithole they'd hit last night. Romeo had dubbed the place Mos Eisley after some town in a Star Wars movie. All afternoon, the kid had been annoying everyone in the barracks with his awful impression of Obi-Wan Kenobi. Mos Eisley, you will never find a more wretched hive of scum and villainy. We must be cautious. What a dork Romeo is. Kemper smiled at the thought as he surveyed the target. A single-story brown stucco building. The house was large by Iraqi standards, probably 700 square feet. Kemper recalled a sketch of the interior he'd seen in the pre-op briefing. A rectangular floor plan with three rooms, a front vestibule, a small kitchen, and a large common room in the back. The compound had seen gunfights in the past. Huge chunks of wall had been blasted out of one corner, and the stucco around the windows was pocked with bullet holes. Heavy tarps hung over glassless window frames. Slivers of light escaped from the corners, bright enough to wash out his night vision. Squinting through his goggles, he shifted his gaze to the front of the house where three vehicles were parked. A white Toyota pickup truck, a small gray sedan with blown-out windows, and a 1990s vintage Mercedes, no doubt belonging to tonight's HVT, Mahmoud bin Jabbar. Left, came Perry's whisper over the wireless headset. Keeping his body perfectly still, Kemper glanced left. A large man, six feet tall, two hundred pounds, was striding toward them, an AK-47 slung at the hip. Kemper tensed, a predator waiting for prey to enter the kill zone. He slowed his breathing and played out kill options in his mind. The Iraqi was two meters away now, and Kemper could see the man's attention was focused on lighting the cigarette he carried in his left hand. He shuffled along the tree line, oblivious to the threat lurking in the tall grass. With his right hand, Kemper silently drew his sog knife from the scabbard secured to his kit. When the terrorist turned his back, Kemper rose into a crouch. The man took a drag on his cigarette while retrieving a mobile phone from a pocket with his free hand. Banking on his distraction, Kemper closed the gap in a heartbeat, wrapped his left arm around the terrorist's neck from behind. With his right hand, he drove the black blade into the space between the base of the jihadist's skull and the top of the first vertebra, severing the connection between brain and body. The big man jerked, then collapsed the instant Kemper withdrew the knife. He eased the limp body to the ground and dragged it backward into the cover of the palm trees where Perry and the others waited. He looked down at his fallen foe. The terrorist's face was awash with fear, his brain confused why the call for oxygen now went unheeded. His eyes, controlled by cranial nerves and not dependent on spinal cord connections, darted back and forth in panic. His mouth hung open in a limp, silent scream. Kemper left the body where it lay and scanned the compound for motion. 
Seeing none, he whispered into his mic. Clear. A click of acknowledgement came into his headset. Then he heard Perry. Choctaw variable, this is Choctaw actual, on time, on target. Choctaw, check, you're a go, came the call from Captain Jarvis on base. Perry used a double click of his transmit button to let Jarvis and the other officers back at the talk know he had heard and acknowledged the instruction. The NCO then signaled with his left hand. The four seals and the spook spread out silently in the brush in preparation for converging on the compound. Choctaw 2, 1, all set, Perry radioed to the team on the north side of the compound. A double click came back. Go, Senior whispered into the mic. The two teams converged on the target building from opposite directions. Four men from the north, five from the south. Each man moved in a tactical crouch, leading with his M4. Kemper scanned for targets over his rifle, following the targeting dot from his PEC-4 infrared designator. The dot, visible only in night vision, glided over the structure, clearing the walls, door, corners, and roofline. Kemper had danced this dance so many times it was almost as if the little green dot had a mind of its own, searching for threats while Kemper only watched. Within ten paces of the compound, his olfactory sense kicked in. The smells here were familiar. Aromatic cooking spices, cigarette smoke, body odor, and an earthen scent he had never been able to identify, but that was prevalent in western Iraq. Just as he could no longer stomach the smell of oysters after a bad bout of food poisoning as a teenager, this cocktail of odors had a primal, overpowering effect on him. This was the smell of danger, the smell of violence, the smell of death. Kemper and the other operators fanned out as they drew closer, drifting into tactical positions on both sides of the front door. He crouched low beneath a window obscured by a heavy wool blanket hanging on the inside. He glanced right and watched Special Operator First Class Sanders, Sandman to his teammates, attach a small explosive charge to the door frame beside the latch. Kemper knew a similar scene was unfolding in mirror image on the other side of the house, the only difference being that the north side team would use a much larger breacher charge to blow a man-size hole in the stucco wall. Roof is clear, a voice said in Kemper's headset. The voice belonged to the overflight drone operator, who was probably stationed thousands of miles away in an air-conditioned room drinking a cup of hot, fresh coffee. This person, whom Kemper imagined as a clean-shaven twenty-something Air Force nerd without a single scar on his soft, pale body, would go home after his shift. He might grab a burrito at Taco Bell, watch a baseball game, and then fall asleep on the sofa with ESPN Sports Center playing on his TV. No moon dust in his eyes, no risk of bodily harm, no blood on his hands. What a weird fucking world. A burst of laughter from inside the house broke the silence and Kemper tensed. My thermal shows three bodies clustered in the front room, seven in the back, said Thiel, who was leading the team on the north side of the compound. This information was helpful, but blooded seals knew better than to trust it as gospel. Perry looked at Sandman, who was ready and waiting, holding the remote detonator in his hand. Sandman met his gaze. Perry nodded, then flashed everyone the thumbs-up signal. Kemper pressed his back against the wall. As he turned his head away from the door, he tilted his NVGs up onto his helmet and squeezed his eyelids shut tight. A flash of light, the deep baritone, whump, and the acrid smell of sulfur left no doubt that Sandman's charge had just blasted a manhole-size opening in the door. Inside the house, someone shrieked in pain. Kemper spun to face the door, brought his rifle up, and followed Romeo through the gap and into the house. Romeo moved right, clearing right. Kemper moved left, clearing left. With the left corner clear, Kemper moved forward, drifting toward the left wall and opening the gap between himself and Romeo. Perry, Sandman, and Jones entered behind them and pushed forward into the gap. The vestibule was clear, except for a single body writhing on the floor. Kemper glanced down. The poor son of a bitch must have been reaching for the doorknob at the exact wrong time, because he was screaming and cradling a bloody stump where his right hand had once been. Kemper stepped onto the man's uninjured left forearm with his oakley boot securing the threat, but leaving his weapon free to sweep. He felt someone move up beside him, and from the corner of his eye he saw Jones crouch down. The spook pressed a knee into the jihadist's chest while covering with his M4. I got him, Jones said. You're clear. Thanks, Kemper grunted. 
He moved forward toward the arched doorway leading to the larger room at the back of the house. He heard a double tap to his right, but kept his focus over his own rifle. Clear, Romeo called from his right. Clear, he answered and fell in behind Sandman and Perry, who were now leading into the archway. Allahu Akbar! screamed a voice from the other room. A single crack from an AK-47 followed, but was drowned out immediately by the chorus of pops as Perry and Sandman fired their Sopmod M4s in unison. Two down, the rest are moving back toward you, Perry said over the wireless to Thiel and the North Team Seals. Kemper heard a whump as Seals' breacher charge blew a hole in the back wall of the house. The explosion was followed immediately by the sounds of gunfire and shouting. Kemper advanced through the doorway into the back room. He sensed motion to his left and spun on his heel, but found only a swinging gray blanket hanging over a glassless window. He moved toward the window. Chunks of cheap cement and stucco sprayed the side of his face as AK-47 rounds peppered the building from somewhere outside. Choctaw, this is Ghost. You have three squirters just exited the west side of the house and moving west toward a tree line. The drone operator's voice was soft and calm in Kemper's ear, in stark contrast to the primal screams and gunfire erupting in the back room. Three and five, pursue the west side squirters, came the order from Perry in a voice as calm and cool as the drone operator's. Kemper felt a hand slap him on the back. With me, Romeo said. Kemper did a 180 and followed Romeo back through the vestibule and out the front door, snapping his NVGs back into place as he did. On your left, an unfamiliar voice said beside him. Kemper glanced left and saw Jones advancing with them. The combat crouch position, the rifle carry, the way the spook held himself in the kit. There could be no doubt Jones was a former operator. The only question left was whether Jones had been a team guy or an Army SOF man in his previous life. But that information could wait. Right now, all that mattered to Kemper was the fact that Jones was blooded and that he would not be a liability if things got hot. At the tree line, Romeo said, angling his trajectory right. Kemper scanned where Romeo was leading with his rifle barrel and spied two men crouching on the ground in front of the palm trees. Romeo screamed in Arabic at the two figures. Face down on the ground or I'll shoot! They closed three more meters and Kemper noted the men were kneeling, not crouching. The figure kneeling on the right side tilted his head back, raised his arms to heaven, and yelled, Allahu Ak! Romeo's Sapmat M4 spat fire and the jihadist's head disappeared in a puff of blood and flying bone fragments. Kemper was about to shoot the other terrorist when Jones hollered, Wait, we need to take Bin Jabbar alive. Is that dude Bin Jabbar? Don't know. Ghost said there were three squirters, Kemper said, shifting his aim to the stand of palm trees. Where the fuck is the third guy? I don't see him, Jones said. You look here, I'll search south. Roger that. From the corner of his eye, Kemper saw Romeo advancing on the remaining terrorist. Put your face on the ground or I'll shoot you too, Romeo barked. Too close, Romeo, Kemper thought, shifting his attention from the trees to his teammate. Suddenly the kneeling jihadist propelled himself face down into the dirt, hands in front, prostrating himself on the ground. The night went still. There was a tink, and Kemper watched a grenade roll out of the terrorist's hand and wobble to a stop at Romeo's feet. Romeo looked at the fragmentation grenade, and then at Kemper. The young seal's expression was sheepish. He flashed Kemper an awkward grin. Oops, I fucked up. There was a flash of mind-numbing white light, a blast of heat, and a punch in the chest. Kemper felt himself flying backward. He hit the ground hard, but quickly scrambled into a combat crouch. He scanned the place where Romeo had been, but his friend was gone. Evaporated. What was left, they would be able to send home in a Ziploc bag instead of a coffin. Jones was yelling, the voice painfully loud in his earpiece, but Kemper ignored the spook. His right calf burned like fire, but he ignored that too. He donned his NVGs, which had been knocked off by the blast, and with his night vision restored, he scanned the tree line. Through a gap in the palm trees, he saw a distant figure turn and run away. He never saw the man's face, but that didn't matter. He knew exactly who the runner was. Mahmoud bin Jabbar. Their mission objective. A Mujahideen coward who'd just ordered his men to martyr themselves so he could slip away into the night. Kemper took a stride forward in pursuit, but his right leg screamed in protest. You need to get a tourniquet on that leg. Jones said, appearing suddenly beside him. 
Looks like you caught some shrapnel. Kemper shrugged off the spook and hobbled toward the tree line. You won't catch him with that injury, Jones called. And neither will I. Kemper spun, ready to read the OGA bastard the riot act, but the words caught in his throat. Jones was drenched in blood and pressing a rag against his right eye socket. Staring at the now one-eyed spook, Kemper keyed his mic. Chukta, three. We're gonna need medevac. ASAP.
clearly this is a sensitive but important matter for Turkey, Bailey was saying as Amanda tuned back in. I think by both of us voicing our concerns today, we've made some headway. Dimitri nodded, a political smile plastered on his face. Honest dialogue, even when contentious, is an important part of any strategic partnership between our two countries. Please convey to the Secretary and President that my government draws a clear distinction between law-abiding Kurdish citizens and Kurdish separatists using terror to pursue an agenda of political unrest and murder. Turkey considers both its native Kurdish population and those seeking asylum from persecution in Syria important and valued minority populations. But we will not tolerate the United States backing any group bent on destabilizing Turkey. Bailey was gearing up to reply, but this time Amanda shot him a look as she began to speak, daring him to try cutting her off again. Director Dimitri, the United States recognizes that Turkey has opened its borders to more than two million Syrians over the past decade of fighting. We understand this has been a heavy burden, both politically and financially, and we thank you for your generosity and compassion when it comes to refugees. That's right, Dimitri said, nodding vigorously, his face lighting up for the first time. You need more on your staff like her, Mr. Ambassador. She understands the sacrifice Turkey has made. It is important for the United States and NATO to understand that for Turkey to remain committed to this strategic partnership, we need financial support from the West. Otherwise, we will have no choice but to explore ways to strengthen our relationships with other regional partners. There's that phrase again, she thought. Strategic partnership. The subtext in Dimitri's message was impossible to miss. Either the U.S. stepped up its financial commitment to help Turkey crush the Kurdish separatist movement, or Turkey would start looking to Moscow instead of Washington for support. Amanda would argue that the process had already begun when Eridan met with Russian President Petrov back in April. I understand, Bailey said, his tone now placating rather than hard. I promise you that Turkey's security and stability are of the utmost importance to the State Department and the Warner administration. I'll pass along your concerns and express the financial hardship Turkey faces. Please see that you do, Mr. Ambassador, Dimitri said, then turned to smile at Amanda. Ms. Allen, your observations were very insightful. I look forward to our next meeting, he said, shamelessly looking her up and down. She ignored his lecherous gaze and forced a smile. It would be wonderful if Azur Bassar from the ministry could attend our next meeting. Her reputation as a champion for women's... She stopped, mid-sentence. Something was wrong. Her stomach was tight, a feeling she'd come to depend on during her training at the farm. She shifted her gaze beyond Dimitri, aware that he was asking her if something was the matter. Across the street, amid a row of taxis, a black Mercedes sat idling, its driver behind the wheel. Is everything okay? The ambassador asked. She ignored Bailey and looked left, her gaze flicking toward the intersection. The man with the magazine looked out of place. The street was crowded and moving, but this guy was standing perfectly still, not reading, just staring at her. Behind him, Parked on the northwest corner sat a white high-top van with no windows in the rear compartment. The magazine man glanced over his shoulder at the van and then fished a phone from his pocket. Oh, shit, she said, and grabbed Ambassador Bailey by the sleeve of his suit coat. Her intention was to run, but a massive pressure wave sent her airborne. The heat hit her a heartbeat later, like she'd opened an oven door while her face was too close to it. She never heard the boom. She didn't remember flying through the air or hitting the ground. Somebody closed the oven door, but the right side of her face still felt hot. And wet, maybe. Her face hurt, but not nearly as bad as the throbbing pain in her head. When she opened her eyes, the imagery was nonsensical. The white van parked in front of her was pointing toward the sky, climbing a perfectly vertical hill. Booted feet approached, belonging to men running on a wall, their... Bodies clinging impossibly at a ninety-degree angle. Nothing made sense. Then something clicked and her proprioception came back. She was lying on her side. That's why the world was askew. 
She coughed, and the right side of her chest exploded with pain. It felt like someone had just driven a flaming sword between her ribs. She blinked. I have to get up. She tried to push herself onto her knees, but it was as if the earth had somehow turned up the power of gravity. No, not gravity. Something was driving her down. A weight from above, not a tug from below. She saw a black boot beside her and realized that it must belong to a man pressing his other foot into the small of her back. With great effort, she turned her head the other way and gazed into the face of her make-believe boss, Ambassador Bailey. His body lay only inches from her. At first, she thought he was dead, but then he blinked, and a tear spilled from his eye, traveled over the bridge of his nose, and dropped to the dirty sidewalk. She saw there was a boot on his neck. Then she saw the muzzle of the rifle against his temple. He opened his mouth to speak, but was interrupted by a flash. The accompanying crack was barely audible, muffled, like a gunshot a thousand yards away. She watched in horror as Bailey's head deflated, his face a balloon squished between two elevator doors, its contents evacuating in a dark pool of blood. Yet he still stared at her, his right eye open, the pupil dilated. A spent casing bounced off the pavement between them, spun in slow motion, and then came to rest by the tip of her nose. A 7.62 rifle round casing. Was it weird that she knew that detail? Other muffled gunshots reverberated. A voice screamed inside her head. Get up! Run! Escape! She agreed with the voice. She wanted to do all these things, but she was pinned to the sidewalk by the boot. A boot that pressed with the weight of an F-150 parked on her back. If only she'd been carrying a weapon. Why didn't they let her kind carry weapons on assignment? A voice laughed at this. Would it have made a difference? Don't be ridiculous, Amanda. As she waited for the terrorist's bullet to come smashing into her temple, a deep and profound sadness engulfed her. I'm sorry, Dad. I'm sorry I let you down. This would devastate him. He wouldn't understand, and worse, he'd never know the truth. She knew how the CIA operated. Despite his prominent status, they would keep him in the dark about what she had really been doing for the United States. They would paint another picture, a selfless young diplomat murdered while trying to make the world a better place. I guess I don't have to worry about keeping my secret anymore. The ground began to shake. At first she thought it was her, her body shaking uncontrollably, but then she smelled the dust and sulfur. The ground shook a second time. Then a third. More bombs. The evil bastards weren't finished yet. She looked up out of the corner of her eye just in time to see the rifle butt coming down. A sharp pain erupted in the back of her head, and then she felt herself being dragged under, dragged against her will into a deep, dark, and inescapable pool. This is Audible. Blackstone Publishing presents Collateral by Brian Andrews and Jeffrey Wilson. This book is read by Ray Porter. We consider Tier 1 fans to be family. Thank you for your love, generosity, and kind online reviews. Be well, stay safe, and always remember, we've got your six. Part 1 Breaking a country is no different than breaking a man. All you have to do is take away hope. Matthias Zinovenko Chapter 1 The Ferry House English Pub, London, England, September 14th, 2147 local time. John Dempsey ducked just before the bottle flying at him could slam into his temple. It sailed over his head instead and smashed into a life-sized ceramic English bulldog positioned just inside the pub's entrance. The bottle, and the bulldog, shattered into a million commingled pieces. The barmaid behind the counter released an eardrum-piercing shriek full of outrage and anguish at the loss of what must have been the pub's mascot— Get out! She screamed, 
All of you brigands! Nobody listened, except for the man Dempsey was there to kill. The Russian operative darted out the pub's double doors, running like a man on fire. The target has just left the building, said a professorial voice through the wireless microtransmitter stuffed deep in Dempsey's right ear canal. The voice belonged to Task Force Ember's signals chief and acting director Ian Baldwin, located in a tactical operations center five time zones away. I know, Dempsey, a former Navy SEAL turned American assassin, said as he blocked a punch from a burly middle-aged local with his forearm. He was about to drive a hook into the guy's jaw, but decided the poor bloke didn't deserve to spend the next six weeks drinking all his meals through a straw. So, instead, he sent the tough guy wannabe flying backward and onto his ass with a two-handed shove. He whirled toward the exit to pursue his quarry, only to find another angry brawler blocking his path. "'Dude, where are you?' said another voice, this one belonging to former SEAL and combat surgeon Dan Munn, who was also sitting in the talk in Florida. "'He's getting away!' "'I know,' Dempsey growled, ducking a jab flying at his face. Well, what the hell are you doing? Somehow Alpha has managed to get himself into a bar fight, came a third voice, this one belonging to Elizabeth Grimes, Ember's sniper in residence and overwatch for tonight's assassination mission. Of course he has, Munn said, and Dempsey could practically hear him shaking his head. Screw this, I say we have Lizzie shoot the target. No, came Baldwin's clipped reply. The DNI was very specific about the approved lethal methods for this operation. No sniper action unless we can disappear the body without incident. Bravo, you are relegated to spotter and exfil activities only. Check, Grimes said, acknowledging the directive. The chatter in Dempsey's ear was beginning to piss him off. And so was the asshole in front of him trying to channel Rocky Balboa. The dude threw a gut punch, which Dempsey caught in a scissor block. The block made the brawler wince, but he was committed and drew back his other fist to try again. Dempsey didn't give him that opportunity. He drove a knee into the man's groin, buckling the wannabe boxer at the waist. Behind you, Grimes said in his ear. Dempsey dropped into a crouch and spun on the balls of his feet. A third dude, the bottle thrower, was charging with a fresh bottle raised overhead and primed to split open Dempsey's skull. Dempsey grabbed him by the shirt, pivoted, and used the attacker's momentum to send him flying into tough guy number two, who was still bent over, clutching his nuts. Both men crashed to the ground in a tangled heap of arms and legs amid a pile of overturned wooden chairs. Dempsey did a quick scan for the next threat, but there was nobody left standing in the tiny pub. For an instant, he locked eyes with the woman behind the bar. Thank God this was London, and not Houston, or else he would be staring down the barrel of a Remington 870. As it was, the only targeting lasers fixed on him at the moment were the invisible ones streaming from her angry eyes. Sorry about your bulldog, he said with an Irish brogue as he turned to leave. Get the fuck out! She screamed as he barreled out the pub's doors and onto the street. And never come back! Which way did he go? Dempsey asked to the ether, scanning right, then left for his target. North on East Ferry Road, Grimes answered. Check, he said, and took off after the Russian spy. After one block, the ancient and uneven brick pavers underfoot transitioned to asphalt, improving Dempsey's footing and letting him push to a full tilt. How are your eyes, Omega? he asked, noting the misty, overcast night sky. We have the target on satellite thermal, Baldwin said. He has a two-block lead on you and is headed toward Mud Shoot Park. Is that the giant fucking goat farm? Yes, John, Baldwin said, breaking OPSEC as usual. Mud Shoot Park and Farm is the largest working farm in London. It's heavily wooded and spans 12 hectares, so I suggest you hurry before you lose him. I know. I know. I'm running. I know you can see that. Dempsey puffed. Oh, we see you. Is that all you got, old man? Munn chimed in. Dempsey didn't answer, preferring to conserve precious oxygen. He hated this shit. Lately, it seemed like every op ended in a foot race, either with him chasing down some fleet-footed asshole, 
or with him running for his life while being shot at by Russians. Ember didn't need operators. What it needed was Olympic middle-distance runners. I'm too old for this shit, he thought as his quads began to burn. Alpha, this is Bravo, Grimes said in his ear. I'm coming down. Going to bring the car around to the east side and reposition on Stebbendale Street. If our tango crosses Millwall Park playing fields, I'll plink him with the long gun. I said no, sniper action. Baldwin's voice had an uncharacteristic hard edge. Accidental death or poison, that was the op -ord. We tried poison, and that didn't work out so well, Munns said. So now it's time to try accidental death. Enlighten me, Dan, if you will. How does a sniper round to the head qualify as accidental death? Baldwin said. It qualifies when the target accidentally walks into Lizzie's bullet while it happens to be flying in the vicinity of his head the former SEAL doc said, oozing with sarcasm. "'Opsec, people, opsec!' snapped an acerbic fourth voice on the line. "'I'm good, but so is British intelligence. GCHQ is listening.' The rebuke from Richard Wang, Ember's cyber and IT expert, was as out of character as truth was from a politician. To Dempsey's surprise, everybody shut up and locked it down. "'Thank God!' He pulled up a mental image of the nearby green space complex consisting of Millwall Park and Mudshoot Farm. He didn't have an eidetic memory, but he'd always had a knack for remembering topography and details from satellite imagery. As a SEAL with the Tier 1 back in the day, it had been his responsibility to plan the ops and know the terrain cold. Yes, they'd had GPS, sun-toe watches, slick tablet computers, and eyes in the sky to monitor their position, but Dempsey knew better than to put all his faith in technology. Because unlike his teammates, technology seemed to have an annoying habit of letting him down when he needed it most. Mudshoot Farm was a genuine anomaly. Nothing of the sort existed in American cities. At 32 acres, it was huge and situated on the Isle of Dogs, a peninsula inside a button-hook bow of the Thames in central London, where real estate was going at a premium. More than just a green space, the farm had a wooded perimeter, an equestrian center, and grazing pastures for cows, pigs, goats, sheep, and llama. The farm had caught Dempsey's attention not only because of its size— but also because it was the perfect place to disappear or wait in ambush. Target is approaching the Chapel House Street intersection, Baldwin reported. And he just vectored east toward the park. Check, Dempsey said. And he appears to be opening the gap, Alpha. Can you possibly run any faster? If I could run any faster he said, his words punctuated by heavy exhales. Then I would be... Target is crossing the northwest quadrant heading for the woods and mudshoot farm, Munn said. Bravo, where are you? Driving but not in position yet, Grimes said. Ninety seconds. Shit, you're going to be too late, Munn said, as if sniper action were still on the table. Arms pumping and legs churning, Dempsey crossed the Manchester Grove intersection. In another two hundred meters, he'd reach the park entrance. Two-story brown brick row houses zipped past him as he sprinted up the middle of Ferry Road between twin columns of parked cars. As he ran, he noted how he could barely feel the form-fitting body armor protecting his torso. This was his first time wearing the brand-new tech Baldwin had procured for all the SAD team members. Unlike traditional anti-ballistic Kevlar vests with heavy, rigid soppy plates, this new vest was light and flexible. The puncture-resistant woven shell concealed a honeycomb interior filled with liquid body armor. Originally conceived at MIT and then refined by DARPA, liquid body armor, or sheer thickening fluid, was flexible and viscous in normal conditions, but instantly hardened when struck by a projectile, deflecting and dispersing the impact force. He'd rolled his eyes and chuckled when Baldwin had presented him with the vest, but after unloading a 30-round magazine of 5.56 at the range and finding it intact, his skepticism had melted away. 
Wearing it now, however, he couldn't help but wonder what critical little piece of information Baldwin had forgotten to mention. He could almost hear the signal chief's voice in his head. Anti-ballistic STF performs flawlessly against all calibers of ammunition, so long as it doesn't get wet. Or maybe liquid body armor is positively impenetrable, provided the gel temperature stays below 91 degrees Fahrenheit. He suddenly found himself wishing for his old, rigid, heavy, uncomfortable-as-fuck body armor. He'd been shot plenty of times in that rig and had walked away every time. Well, almost every time. Target is in the woods, Munn reported, just as Dempsey reached the park entrance. He hurtled the entry gate and ran a dogleg path left, slowing and looking for cover as he scanned the tree line. His spidey sense was tingling as the risk profile shifted. The Russian was in cover now and Dempsey was exposed, especially while crossing the field. "'Do you have eyes on my tango?' Dempsey said, panting and dropping into a crouch. "'Hold,' came Baldwin's reply. "'The target is loitering just inside the tree line, four hundred feet from your position.' Dempsey took a knee and pulled a compact Sig Sauer from his underarm holster. Wishing he had night vision goggles, he scanned the tree line over the new, low-profile SAS fiber tritium sights. Bearing? 045 true. Check, Dempsey said, verifying his watch compass heading and adjusting his aim right. The target is moving, Baldwin said, his voice ripe with tension. Moving north and east through the trees— Dempsey popped up from his crouch and sprinted along the line he'd just been sighting. He crossed a walking path and wove his way into the trees and underbrush. Target is out of the woods, crossing what looks like a very large vegetable patch. He's heading for one of the paddocks, Baldwin said. I'm on it, Dempsey said, pressing forward through the surprisingly dense undergrowth with a cringe-worthy lack of stealth. Oh, dear. Oh, dear what? Dempsey said, his voice low and hushed. We lost him. How is that even possible? He must suspect we have him on satellite thermal because he moved in among the animals, sheep, I suspect, and entered a barn-like structure. He must be on all fours because we cannot identify which heat signature is his. Are you telling me you can't tell the difference between a man and a bunch of sheep? Dempsey said through clenched teeth. Duty's telling you straight, Munn interjected. It just looks like a bunch of yellow-orange blobs huddled together. Ridiculous, Dempsey murmured and couldn't help but think how he'd gone from being a kitted-up Tier 1 SEAL, fast-roping with his unit out of stealth hawks behind enemy lines, to this. A dude stalking sheep in a petting zoo. In the distance, sirens began to wail. There's a police cruiser en route to the ferry house pub, Wang reported, his voice all business. Time to wrap this up, Alpha, Baldwin said. You have five minutes to eliminate the target or I'm terminating the op. Yeah, yeah, easy for you to say over your tea and biscuits, Dempsey thought, as he grudgingly acknowledged Baldwin's order with a double click of his tongue. He advanced silently and methodically toward the animal pen where the Russian operative was hiding. The perimeter was kept by a sturdy four-foot-tall slatten-wire fence with two swing gates. Inside, the turf had been grazed down to bare dirt. A simple, twenty-foot-long windowless shelter with a flat metal roof occupied the south end of the pen. With his pistol trained on the building, he eased along the fence until the opening of the shelter, wide enough to permit free and easy movement in and out by the animals, came into view. The inside of the shelter was pitch black, but he could make out grayish blobs moving just inside the opening. A second later, the smell hit him, and one of the animals let out a throaty, prolonged bleat. Yep, definitely sheep. If this were Afghanistan, the tactical solution would be simple. Toss a grenade in the barn and hose down everything that came out, but this wasn't the stan. In central London, Lobbing grenades and shooting anything, even a bunch of sheep, was off the table, which meant he had no choice but to go in after his target. And he could predict how that would play out. 
The minute he entered the barn, commotion would ensue. The animals would bleat and shit and scuttle, and while he milled about trying to find a crouching human in the chaos, his adversary would plink him with an easy headshot. Dempsey cursed to himself, trying to decide what to do. "'What is the problem, Alpha?' Baldwin said, his tone more annoyed than concerned. "'He's trying to figure out how to get the sheep out of the barn without discharging his weapon,' Munn answered for Dempsey. "'Ah, yes, do be careful not to kill any sheep, John,' Baldwin said. "'This needs to look like a mugging gone bad, not a shootout.' Dempsey clenched his jaw in irritation and stood there motionless, siding over his cig at the entrance. For the first time in his long and decorated career, he was experiencing tactical paralysis. Tactical paralysis in a petting zoo, he thought. God, what have I become? He crept back to a position with a perpendicular firing angle on the enclosure. The sidewalls didn't have any windows, just a series of drilled ventilation holes that would be virtually impossible to sight and fire through. I needed a distraction, he decided. He scanned the ground until he found a rock the size of his fist. He knelt and picked it up. Fuck it, he murmured, looking at the rock, and then lobbed it in a high arc at the shelter. The rock hit the metal roof dead center with a loud metallic clang that echoed through the park. Terrified sheep poured out of the enclosure in a woolly, stinky stampede, bleating, stomping, and defecating en masse. At the same time, Dempsey jumped the perimeter fence and charged forward in a low crouch. A sheep screamed to his left. The animal's cry was so uncannily human that he reflexively swiveled and sighted before dismissing the threat. He pivoted back toward the enclosure and felt the shift he'd been waiting for. Into the combat slipstream where all anxiety, uncertainty, and doubt evaporated. His mind and body unified into a state of hyper-awareness and fluidity. With his weapon up in a two-handed grip and index finger tension on the trigger, he closed on the doorway. Then something happened he did not expect. The sheep re-coalesced into a compact herd and charged back toward the enclosure, apparently collectively deciding it was safer back inside than out here with him. On instinct, he went with them. Ducking as low as possible, he grabbed a fistful of wool on the back of a fat ewe and went in behind her like she was his blocking fullback. As he broke the plane of the doorway, he pulled the sheep tight to his chest, dug in his heels, and re-vectored her momentum radially. As they rotated in place, he scanned over her back for anything human-shaped in the shadows. A crack of gunfire exploded inside the metal structure, three deafening bangs along with three brilliant muzzle flashes from the back right corner. His sheep shield bleated and shuddered, a fat, woolly bullet cushion as it took all three of the rounds. Dempsey returned fire, two rounds of his own into the corner, but the Russian was already rolling right, and the slugs punched two holes harmlessly in the wall. Dempsey's ovine bodyguard suddenly became dead weight as the sheep's legs buckled. Its decision to die in that instant was unfortunate for Dempsey because the Russian squeezed off another round. This one hit Dempsey center mass, square between his pecs. Instead of the familiar impact jab he was accustomed to when taking a round in Kevlar, he felt a sharp, rippling tension across the breadth of his chest, and then nothing. The bullet had gone through his vest like a knife through butter. Motherfucker, he thought as he returned fire at the Russian shadow. I knew this shit was too good to be true. He scrambled right in the chaos, the gunfire having sent the sheep into blind pandemonium. Any second now, his breath would grow wet and raspy as his chest filled with blood, his blood pressure would drop, his arms would grow impossibly heavy, and his legs would turn to jelly. But none of those things happened. Was it possible that Baldwin's vest full of magic slime had actually friggin' worked? Still strong and in the fight, Dempsey grabbed a fleeing ewe, smaller than the last, and ducked down behind her. Instead of firing over her back, he sighted around her ass. Muzzle flashes lit up the inside of the shelter as the Russian emptied his magazine. Multiple rounds slammed into Dempsey's sheep, 
and it sprayed the side of his face with shit pellets. He returned fire, aiming just below the muzzle flashes. Crack, crack, crack. A human-shaped shadow dropped, hitting the dirt with a thud. Dempsey released his grip on his second sheep, and the ewe collapsed beside him. He shifted from a crouch to a tactical knee, his sig trained on his target, with whom he was finally alone in the barn. The Russian groaned and wheezed as he made a futile belly crawl toward the pistol he'd dropped, now a meter away. Stop, Dempsey said in Russian, surprised how the word came to him automatically. He'd been taking lessons from Buzz, who claimed Dempsey had the worst language skills of anyone he'd ever taught. This was the first time the language had come to him without trying. The Russian stopped and strained a backward look at him. Dempsey pressed to his feet and walked over to the man, keeping a proper standoff in case the Russian operator wasn't quite as wounded as he was letting on. The two men locked eyes, victor and vanquished. The spy said something to him, but the only word he caught was Zhukov. It didn't matter, though, because he knew his enemy well enough to infer the question. Dempsey was hunting Zetas, the Russian Federation's most secret and lethal black ops task force, taking them out one by one until he'd worked his way to the top. No, Zhukov didn't send me, Dempsey said, answering in English this time. Shane Smith did. Confusion washed over the other man's face, the murdered Ember director's name clearly unknown to him. Dempsey wasn't surprised. Only one Zeta had survived the horrific attack ordered by Russian spymaster Arkady Zhukov on Ember's secret compound in Virginia three months ago. Apparently, this dude wasn't that guy. De oppresso liber, comrade he said and squeezed the trigger, completing the mission and ending the life of yet another Zeta. Well, that certainly didn't go as planned, Baldwin said in his ear as the last wisp of smoke from Dempsey's muzzle faded into the ether. Where there had been only one siren wailing before, now a chorus screamed in the night. What do you want me to do with the body? Dempsey asked. Leave it. Baldwin said through a defeated sigh. And you can explain to the DNI why you violated the op board. Roger that, he said, holstering his weapon as he ducked out of the barn. Exfil North, Grimes said in his ear. I'll pick you up in the Asda Superstore parking lot. Check. Hurry, they're coming, she said. I know, he said, a surge of fresh adrenaline helping get his sluggish legs moving. As he ran, thoughts of the next mission began to take shape. Hey, Omega. What is it, Alpha? Baldwin answered, still irritated. A malign smile curled Dempsey's lips. I'm ready for the next target.
structure and cleared the narrow walkways that reached forward on either side. Two oval hatchways, both of which appeared to be shut, provided port and starboard side access to the bridge tower. The Israeli commandos took mirror image positions, sighting around the corners toward the bow along the walkways. Jarvis dropped to a knee behind the base of a static crane and scanned again for human figures on the catwalks and in porthole windows on the superstructure. In his mind, a countdown timer silently ticked off the seconds in the background. An uncanny skill he'd first realized he possessed at the Naval Academy. At the two-minute mark, he keyed his mic. Two, three, reposition inboard. He watched the two commandos check the side rails one last time and then move away from the corners, both taking a knee inboard of the hatches with their weapons at the ready. He shifted his radio to Vox. One minute. The unmistakable thrum of helicopters on approach rumbled like a storm in the night. It wouldn't be long until the noise reverberated loud enough that it was audible inside the superstructure, and when that happened, their enemy would finally wake up. A beat later, night turned to day on the main deck as Muharram's floodlights kicked on. An alarm wailed overhead, ear-piercing and angry. Jarvis spied movement on a catwalk high above him. A hatch swung open, and two men emerged holding assault rifles. Jarvis put the dot of his holocide on the forehead of the first shooter and squeezed the trigger, dropping the man. He shifted his aim to the second sniper and this time sent two rounds into the torso of the figure, who dropped his weapon and crumpled in a heap against the railing. On the main deck, the port and starboard superstructure hatches flung open, and enemy sailors began pouring out onto the cargo deck, with AK-47s at the ready. Two, three, stand by. Shooter's coming at you, he whispered. Engage at will. Gunfire and muzzle flash erupted from his two commandos. In seconds, all 13 AK-47 armed terrorists were bleeding on the deck, having gotten off only a few stray shots in the confusion. Jarvis scanned the catwalks and bridge wings for more snipers. Seeing none, he said, Two and three, commence phase two. Behind him, the helos had arrived and Neptune assaulters were executing their fast rope drops. Jarvis sprinted toward the bridge tower as two and three breached the port and starboard hatches, disappearing out of sight. He anticipated a second wave of enemy shooters topside any moment. When he reached the bridge tower, he angled his weapon around the corner and fired several bursts along the port walkway before popping his head around for a quick look. Clear. As he moved toward the hatch, gunfire erupted and bullets ricocheted and sparked around him. He glanced up and saw a shooter on a catwalk two levels up firing at him through the grating. A round from an unseen Israeli teammate took care of the problem, and he dashed through the open hatch into the superstructure, unscathed. Scanning over his rifle, he had three choices. Take a passage leading forward, take a passage leading athwart ships, or take the ladder up. Schematics had shown the bridge on the 04 level, so he needed to go up. Two was nowhere in sight, which meant the Israeli operator had already advanced up to the 02 or possibly 03 level. Jarvis climbed the ladder, sighting over his M4. Before he'd made it halfway up, gunfire erupted somewhere above. He paused to beat, and then, leading with his muzzle, he broke the plane to the next level. He cleared the passage left and right, only his torso sticking out of the ladder well. A door swung open, and a bearded figure stepped out into the passage, still securing the sling to his rifle. When he saw Jarvis, the enemy crewman spun on a heel and ran. Jarvis's 5.56 round plowed through the back of the man's head and sent him pitching forward down the passage. One, two, set on level four, came a voice in his ear. Check, he said, coming to you. More gunfire echoed above, heavier this time. One, three, engaging. Jarvis climbed a couple more ladders to the zero-four level and joined two who was in a combat kneel, sighting down the narrow portside passageway leading to the bridge. The intensity of gunfire coming from the starboard side was picking up. Looks like we picked the easy side, Jarvis said with a wry grin. He's unlucky that way, the Shayatet commando said with a heavy Israeli accent, referring to three. Just ask his last several girlfriends. Poor bastard. I think I should give him a hand. Then into his mic boom, Jarvis said, Three, one, coming to you. Roger, one. I'm caught in a crossfire in the middle of the passage. I have a shooter forward and a shooter aft. Copy, three. Then turning to two, Jarvis chopped a hand forward. Next, he pointed to himself and chopped his hand toward the crossing passageway. Let's flank them. 
The Israeli nodded and they split, two advancing and Jarvis crossing via the rearmost passage to the other side of the ship. He moved in a combat crouch, scanning over his weapon and pausing at a shut hatch in the middle of the passage. With three caught in a crossfire, taking time to clear the room was problematic, but so was leaving himself open for an ambush from behind. With his left hand, he pulled a tactical mirror from a pocket on his kit and angled it for view inside the porthole. The room appeared empty, so he checked that the hatch was dogged shut hard into its stop and then ducked to cross beneath the porthole. He advanced the remainder of the passage to the intersection, where he stopped and used the mirror for a glimpse around the corner. He saw three pressed into an alcove on the port bulkhead, ducking behind a water fountain and taking fire from both sides. Muzzle flares flashed at the forward end of the passage. There's the forward shooter. A beat later, he watched a torso angle out from a nearby doorway, fire a burst up the passage at three and then disappear behind a door frame. And that's the aft shooter. Jarvis commenced a silent count. One, two, three. AK-47 gunfire, forward shooter, four, five, return fire, that's three, six, seven, AK-47 gunfire, and the ash shooter. Jarvis dropped to a knee, exhaled, and started the count anew. On the three count, AK-47 rounds ripped down the passage, starting the pattern over again. Four, five. Jarvis leaned out into the passageway, sighting at the spot where he'd just seen the aft gunman. He waited, tension on the trigger. A head full of shaggy hair emerged. Jarvis squeezed off a round. The top of the head exploded in a red cloud and the man slid down the door frame to the floor. Jarvis pulled back around the corner and checked his six, verifying the hatch behind him was still shut. A beat later, gunfire popped toward the front of the long passage. One, two, came the report over the wireless. Forward shooter is dead. With both enemy shooters down, Jarvis moved swiftly around the corner and up the passageway to three, scanning over his rifle. You okay? he asked, crouching beside the Israeli operator who was still dug in next to the water fountain. The commando nodded tightly but pointed to where a red stain was growing on the thigh of his gray tactical pants. Artery or bone? Jarvis asked. The operator shook his head. Just a graze. I'm operational. Two. One. I'm going to breach with three on starboard. You go port. Copy. Repositioning to port. Taking the lead, Jarvis and three moved forward along the passage toward the bridge, clearing two crossing passages en route. When they reached the hatch to the bridge, Jarvis pressed his back to the bulkhead and used his tactical mirror to survey the bridge through the porthole window in the hatch. Two shooters in the forward port corner and one in the forward starboard corner. One crewman at the helm, another on a radio with a rifle beside him, and then a man seated between them, probably the captain. He reported softly into his mic. Can't see the rear corners. A double click in his ear told him that two copied the report. Jarvis watched and waited as three prepped a breacher charge inside the hinges on the hatch. In his mind, Jarvis pictured two performing the exact same operation in mirror image. Once the charge was set, three glanced at Jarvis. Wordlessly, they both repositioned clear of the blast arc. Set. Two reported a beat later. Jarvis lowered his head, looked away, and said, On my mark. Three, two, one. The breacher detonation roared in the narrow metal passageway, the concussive shockwave hitting Jarvis in the chest like a club. He turned in time to see the hatch tumble into the bridge, blown completely off its hinges. Without missing a beat, he was up and moving into the bridge. He spun right first, killing the shooter he'd seen in the forward starboard corner. Next, he swung his M4 left and used a headshot to down one of two shooters in the forward port corner at the same time as two took out the other. In his peripheral vision, he saw three clearing the rear starboard corner. He crouched low and continued to spin toward the helm. An AK-47 barked and a 7.62 round smacked the steel bulkhead just over his head. The higher-pitched double crack of an M4 discharging behind him ended that threat, but a different, bearded crewman lunged and grabbed the barrel of Jarvis's M4 mid-swing. At the same time, the bearded fighter drew a revolver from a thigh holster. Jarvis stepped in and smashed his helmet into the man's nose and followed with a knee strike to the groin. The pistol discharged, sending a round into the floor. Jarvis stepped left, crashed his forearm down on the back of the man's wrist, breaking the bone and freeing his weapon. He dropped his shoulder and took a knee, then squeezed off two rounds with upward trajectories. 
the first blowing out the crewman's jaw and the second exiting the crown of the head. The captain barked surrender in Arabic, and both he and the helmsman threw their hands up in defeat. The crewman manning the radio, however, was too slow, and took a bullet in the temple from three. Bridge is secure, Jarvis said as his teammates forced the remaining two men onto their faces. Fantail, secure, came the reply from a voice he recognized as four. Mercury, this is Neptune. We have confirmed Ophelia in the cargo hold, a new voice added, using the code word for the illegal Iranian arms shipment. Check, Jarvis said. Any Kazivak? Negative, Mercury, said Neptune. Just a minor ankle injury. Roger, we have a non-urgent flesh wound here, Jarvis said. Ready for exfil. Copy. We have a helo en route, nine mics out, with a proxy crew to take control of the ship. We'll exfil the two wounded on that bird, and everyone else will exfil as briefed. Roger that, Neptune. Nice work, Jarvis said. You too, Mercury. Not bad for a yank. Jarvis lowered the barrel of his M4 until it pointed at the floor. He checked his watch and then let himself smile. They'd conducted a flawless ship takedown in less than ten minutes from initial boarding. The Israeli proxy crew would be here soon to sail the ship to Haifa and confiscate the rockets that had been intended for terrorists. Tonight, millions of Israelis were sleeping a little easier, but none of them would ever know the reason why. The next six hours passed in a blur as the survivors were taken off the ship. The command of the vessel passed to the Israeli Navy, and endless checks were conducted by the security detail. Jarvis felt a new sense of camaraderie and respect from the rest of the Shayatet 13 commandos as they flew together by helicopter back to base. Not only did he feel like part of the team now, he felt like a brother. After stowing their gear and debriefing with the head shed, they were free until the 2000 briefing. After checking in on the Israeli operator designated as three to make sure the man's thigh wound had been patched up okay, Jarvis stepped out into the light of day. But before wandering back to his very dark and very cold air-conditioned room to grab some well-deserved rack time, he needed to work out the knots from the tension of combat. Some guys hit the weights, others put on their running shoes, but Jarvis's preferred means of decompression was an open-water three-mile swim. And so, with goggles and fins in hand, he made his way to the beach in front of the base. As he stripped off his shirt, a voice behind him said, There's a wonderful gym on the base, I'm told. Jarvis didn't look over at the thin, middle-aged Israeli smoking a cigarette and sitting on a nearby rock. He'd already decided that the man's presence was of no immediate concern, especially here, on a beach secured by the Shayatet 13. Nevertheless, the man had garnered Jarvis's attention because he was the only person on the beach dressed in slacks and a starched shirt. He was no Shayatet commando, this man, but Jarvis had assigned him an 85% probability of being a spook. I imagine that most of the Shayatet maritime commandos are probably there now. If you're looking for company, the man continued. I'm not, Jarvis said, looking over, and set his brain to work trying to match this man's face with everyone he'd met, seen in pictures, or surveilled. A beat later, he had it. This guy had been in the talk during last night's pre-mission brief, standing quietly by the back door, chain-smoking. The Israelis stood and flicked the filterless cigarette toward the rolling surf. It landed on the wet sand, rolled a half foot, and then lay smoldering, until a wave took it. Those things will kill you, Jarvis said. So they tell me, the man said with a wry smile. But in my line of work, to live long enough to die from cancer would mean only one thing. And what's that? That I was a miserable failure. Jarvis laughed and decided he liked this spook. The Israeli took a step toward him and extended his hand. Levi Harel. Jarvis clasped the other man's hand. Kelso Jarvis. Nice to meet you, Commander. Shayatet 13 has much they can learn from one of JSOC's Tier 1 seals. I hope they are taking advantage of the opportunity. Jarvis scanned Harel's face probing for subtext or insincerity, but found none, and so he worded his reply accordingly. I think there's much we can learn from each other. Harrell nodded. Indeed, indeed. 
learning from each other is exactly the reason you are here, as opposed to one of a half dozen other tier one operators who applied for the exchange program. I must confess, I've had my eye on you for some time. Congratulations on selecting for O5, incidentally. Apparently this chance encounter was clearly anything but. It seems you've caught me at a disadvantage, Mr. Harrell, Jarvis replied. You've clearly done your homework on me, but I wasn't afforded the same opportunity. I'm sorry, Harrell said. It's a terrible habit. My staff tells me I'm always playing games, but I say life is too short not to play games. Besides, how we play says more about us than how we fight. If that's your philosophy, then maybe for your next exchange program billet, you should request someone from Navy Morale, Welfare, and Recreation instead of from the Tier 1. MWR is all about fun and games. See, there you go, Harrell said with a chuckle. I knew you had a sense of humor hiding in that commando body of yours. Jarvis sighed. As fun as trading jokes with you is, I've got a three-mile swim to do, so... You'll excuse me? Not a problem. Go enjoy your swim. We can talk about your future another time, Harrell said, when you're not busy. You always like this, Jarvis said, shaking his head. Harrell shrugged. Yes. In that case, what about my future is Mossad so interested in? Not Mossad, just me. In our current positions, we are instruments of policy, but down the road, men like us must transition or we become irrelevant. Jarvis narrowed his eyes, intrigued. And by transition, you're speaking of command. I was going to say that we must transition from being instruments of policy to the architects of policy, but command works too, Harrell said, fishing another cigarette from his pack. Very American construct, command. So you're out here on the beach this morning to recruit me to be your, what, your American mole in JSOC? Harrell screwed up his face at this and made an angry pfft sound. There's no reason to insult me. I'm not looking for a mole. I'm here because I was hoping to forge an alliance. The day will come when we'll both need a friend on the other side. I believe our countries share something much more intimate than defense contracts and Hanukkah. And what's that? We share enemies, my friend. Enemies everywhere. Jarvis met Harrell's gaze, and in the other man's eyes he saw integrity, wisdom, and hope. It was you, wasn't it? He asked. You're the reason they put me on last night's stick. The spook flashed him a sly grin. What's the point of the exchange program if Shayatet is going to keep you locked up in the talk? Like I said... There is much we can learn from each other. Allies work together. Allies fight together. Jarvis flashed Harrell a smile of his own. You ever heard of Texas Hold'em? Harrell shook his head. No. It's a poker game. Maybe after the 20 hundred brief, if there's nothing going on, we could grab a beer and I'll teach you. After all, you like playing games. Harrell nudged a new cigarette from the pack. Uh, except, under one condition. What's that? Beers are on me, Harrell said, turned, and walked away. He watched the man head up the beach toward Chateau Pellerin, the castle that rose like a fortress from the center of Atlit naval base. As the Mossad spy disappeared from view, Jarvis replayed in his mind the most profound snippet of their conversation. We share enemies, my friend. Enemies everywhere. Part 1. Never Underestimate the Power of Murder Arkady Zhukov Chapter 1. Present Day, Key West, Florida, April 8th, 0830 Local Time Dempsey squinted against the glare of the morning sun. Despite it being April and despite it being early, he could already tell that today was going to be a hot one. A bead of sweat ran down his back between his shoulder blades. Hot and muggy. Things could be worse, he told himself. I could be in Iraq. 
Key West was a ghost town this time of day. The streets were deserted, the town's all-night revelers having long since found a bed to pass out in, their own or that of a willing stranger. On the horizon, beyond where Green Street dead ended at Front Street, he could make out the marina and its docks stretching like fingers into the blue. The Keys formed the boundary line separating the warm waters of the Gulf of Mexico from the Atlantic, and the mixing of currents helped support a vibrant marine ecology. But he wasn't here on vacation. No snorkeling or deep-sea fishing for him today. He was in Key West on business. Ember business. His target was inside Captain Tony's saloon. As he scanned the area, the cool metal of the Sig Sauer 229 against the small of his back reminded him not to take anything for granted. It was extremely unlikely that either he or his target was being surveilled, but the evidence of the past few months had proven that simply being on American soil did not guarantee his safety. He slipped on his wraparound sunglasses and turned right, walking down Green Street toward the corner and adding a tired stumble to his gait for anyone who might be watching from behind a window or inside a parked car. He pulled out his phone as he approached the corner and made a show of rotating and repositioning the screen for optimal viewing in the sunlight, when in fact his real objective was to scan the street and check his six. Satisfied, he walked to the corner of Telegraph Lane, where he stopped and leaned against the newspaper box, this time pretending to make a call while checking the next block. He spied a single car pulled in tight to the curb, facing him on the one-way street, and, despite the tinted windows, he saw motion inside. He crossed the street, heading south on Telegraph and pretending to talk on the phone, all the while keeping his eyes fixed on the car. As he approached, he could hear that the engine was running, and the driver, a twenty-something male, was watching him. Dempsey lowered the phone from his ear and reached around to slip it in a back pocket, putting his hand inches from his pistol. Suddenly, the rear driver's side door popped open. Dempsey's hand went immediately to grip his sig, and his body came alive with adrenaline. He squared his shoulders to the vehicle, readying himself for whatever threat climbed out. A bare foot with brightly painted toenails appeared below the door sill, followed a beat later by another. You are such an asshole, Doug, a young woman hollered as she stumbled out of the car onto the sidewalk. She slammed the door, and when she saw Dempsey looking at her, she smiled and attempted to straighten her tangled hair. With blushing cheeks, she crossed the street and headed north on Telegraph as the car pulled away from the curb. The driver beeped twice at the girl, who waved, and then turned left on Green Street and disappeared. Dempsey released his grip on the pistol and let his arm fall to his side. With no other cars, and no suspicious characters loitering in the vicinity of Captain Tony's saloon, he decided it was time to head inside. There was absolutely no telling how this encounter was going to go, so he readied himself for the worst. As he stepped inside, he expected to be hit by a blast of cool A.C., but the bar wasn't running any air conditioning. He slipped off his sunglasses, pausing a beat to let his eyes adjust to the dim, ambient light. He quickly checked the exits, having scouted the place in advance yesterday. Three middle-aged women occupied a booth to his left. They looked sunburned, haggard from lack of sleep, and hung over. The only other patron in the joint sat on a stool at the bar, his hunched back callously turned to the entry. Overhead, hundreds of bras, donated over the years by inebriated female patrons, swayed gently in the breeze. Sit anywhere you's like, the overweight barkeep said without looking up. Dempsey nodded and feigned indecision about where to sit. Meanwhile, the bartender shifted his attention to the hunched figure on the stool. Rough night, Doc? the bartender asked. Yeah, the man groaned. Coffee, Mike. Sure thing, the barkeep laughed, filling a mug with coffee. Hope last night ended with you landing a hot-bodied chick in your bed for once. The man grumbled something inaudible in reply, and Captain Tony waddled into the kitchen. Dempsey walked to the bar, not happy that the initial approach would require him to place his back to the door. With a final glance at the entrance, he took the stool beside his target, keeping one foot on the ground ready to move and react if needed. His gaze fell to the small tattoo on the man's left wrist. A seal trident, 
with six stars underneath. Dan Munn looked older than Dempsey remembered, and thinner by at least twenty pounds. The last time he'd seen his friend was in the hospital, when the former SEAL turned special warfare surgeon was overseeing Jack Kemper's recovery from spine surgery after he'd broken his back on a mission with his old unit. That was only a year ago, but it felt like a lifetime. So much change. So much pain and regret. Dempsey swallowed. Munn hadn't met John Dempsey yet, and he wondered what would happen when his former teammate looked at him. Would recognition flash in his friend's eyes? Would Munn's eyes fall to the serpentine scar on Dempsey's left forearm, an unerasable mark of the seal he'd once been? Would their bond, forged in the kilns of violence and brotherhood, allow Munn to see past the modifications made to his face by the plastic surgeon's scalpel? He blew air through his teeth. He was about to find out. Dempsey placed a gentle hand on his broken friend's shoulder. You look like shit, Munn, he said. Too many margaritas last night? Munn's eyes sprung open, but he didn't look over. His face was frozen, as if he'd just heard the voice of a ghost. Jack? He whispered, keeping his gaze straight ahead. Yeah, Dan. It's me. Munn turned his head slowly, his eyes wide with what looked more like terror than surprise. Jack? He said again, this time with a trembling voice. He blinked hard several times and looked confused when Dempsey didn't disappear. But you're dead. I saw your coffin in the hangar. I went to the funeral. Kate and Jacob were there. Jack Kemper is dead, my friend. Dead and buried, he said as gently as possible. You can call me Dempsey now. John Dempsey. Munn's face turned red, and for a moment, Dempsey thought the man might be having a heart attack. But Munn spun off the stool with speed that took Dempsey by surprise, as did the force with which his fist flew toward the side of Dempsey's face. He parried the blow with his right forearm, rotated his grip, and clutched Munn's wrist. He pulled the last of his surviving Tier 1 SEAL brothers close. Stop it, he ordered, as the surgeon stumbled from the bar stool. It's me, Dan. It's me. I swear to God. Munn shifted into a tactical stance they'd learned in the teams and glared at him, his glazed and drunken eyes now alive and full of fire. You sick son of a bitch, Munn said, spittle flying from his lips and his drunken slur now barely noticeable. The surgeon swung again. This time, Dempsey chose not to block the punch. Instead, he turned his head just before impact to lessen the blow. Still, he tasted coppery blood as the inside of his cheek split against his teeth. He dropped to a knee, both for effect and also hoping to preempt another blow. Munn needed to get a swing in, but Dempsey wasn't keen on taking another punch. How could you fucking do that to me, Jack? How could you let me think you were dead? How could you fucking... Munn choked on the words and tears streamed down his cheeks. I died that day. I died with you and everyone else. I died with Thiel and Spaz and Pablo. My marriage died, you fucking asshole. How could you not tell me you survived? Munn's fists were balled at his sides, but Dempsey had the sense Munn was done throwing punches, for now. The hell is going on here? A voice boomed from behind the bar. Everything okay, Doc? It's okay. Dempsey said, his hands raised to Munn in surrender. He watched as Captain Tony reached under the bar, presumably for the loaded handgun he concealed there. I'm a friend of Doc Munn's. Isn't that right, Dan? Dempsey asked, rising back to his feet. Munn stared back, his eyes full of rage, but said nothing. You don't look like any friend of yours, mister. So why don't you get the hell out of here before I call the cops? Munn's shoulders sagged. Then he dropped to the floor, landing cross-legged before Dempsey. It's okay, Tony, he mumbled to the barkeep. I know him. There was a pause, and then Munn looked up, red-eyed. This man was my friend. But he sure as hell ain't my friend anymore. 
Dempsey reached a hand down to the former frogman. Let's go grab some breakfast and talk. I've got nothing to say to you. I know. But I've got plenty to say to you, and it starts with an apology. I'm sorry for what I just put you through, and I'm sorry for bringing back all the pain. I know how you feel because I lost everyone, too, and I had to suffer alone, just like you. But now I'm here, and regardless of what you might think, we're still brothers. How? Mun asked. How'd you pull it off? Dempsey answered the complicated question in a single word. Jarvis. Munn reached up and let Dempsey pull him to his feet, but then shook his hand free. I'd like to pay his tab, Dempsey said, turning to the bar owner. Captain Tony snorted. Today's or the whole thing? Dempsey laughed and looked at Munn, but the man was staring at the floor. The whole thing, he said and handed over a credit card. Well, you're sure as shit a friend now, the big man said with a chuckle, taking the card. Sorry, Doc, he added. Munn waved his hand over his shoulder but didn't turn around. Dempsey signed the receipt for the $500 tab and added an absurdly generous tip. Shit, make that my new best friend, Tony said, taking the receipt and handing back his card. See you tomorrow, Doc. I doubt it, Dempsey said with a smile. Thanks for being a friend to him. You taking him somewhere? The bartender asked. Dempsey put his arm around Munn's hunched shoulders and as he led him out of the bar, he looked over his shoulder and said, Yeah, I'm taking him home. Munn hissed like some creature of the night and shielded his eyes as they stepped outside into the light of day. Dempsey led the dock to a restaurant across the street and selected a table in the back, seating Munn between him and the door so he could keep his friends six clear. The waitress stopped by a beat later and Dempsey ordered two black coffees and two breakfast scrambles. So, I hear you're working in a VD clinic, Dempsey said, breaking the silence. It's not a fucking VD clinic, Munn grumbled. It's an urgent care center. I take care of all kinds of shit. Sure. On paper, Dempsey said, defaulting to the ribbing that had carried them through many a tough mission on the teams. But the word on Duval Street is that if you have the clap, then you go see Doc Munn on the night shift. Or if you need stitches, Munn countered, with more than a little irritation. Or have a foreign object wedged in an incompatible orifice. Or are having a heart attack, Munn said. The coffees arrived and Munn greedily took a long swallow. Then he looked down, and Dempsey watched him start picking at the gusset stitching along the knee of his ridge-lined pant. The doc was either planning his next zinger or drifting back to his dark place. Dempsey couldn't tell which. I'm not accusing you of having VD, Dan, just taking care of people with it, Dempsey said, grinning. Yeah, well, no different than taking care of spaz back in the day, right? Munn chuckled before catching himself. Dempsey watched his face cloud over again. Yeah, Dempsey said, and let the silence that followed hang in the air while Munn wrestled his demons. With the massacre of the Tier 1 SEALs during Operation Crusader, they'd both lost their brotherhood. It's okay to remember them, he said at last. You just can't let yourself get sucked down the vortex every time you do. Munn looked up at him, the fog in his eyes now burned completely away by emotional and chemical sobriety. How did you survive, Jack? Munn whispered, watching the bartender putting away glasses and restocking her beer fridge for the next onslaught in a few hours. You were in the talk in Djibouti. It was hit right after the ambush in Yemen. Everyone was killed. Everyone. How did you manage to get out? Then something like an epiphany washed over his face. Or were you never actually there? No, I was there, all right, Dempsey said his voice trailing off while he decided what to say next. Certain questions needed to be answered for Munn to be of any value to Ember. The taste of that was bitter, doling out just enough information to ensure his lifelong friend became an asset of value. He swallowed down the revulsion at the cold spook he was becoming and reminded himself 
that there was a methodology to the madness, the same methodology Shane Smith had used on him. Right now, Mun needed purpose. Right now, Mun needed tough love. It was okay to throw the head shrinker handbook at his friend. If he failed, Mun would end up hunched over on some other bar stool in some other bar by some other beach. Dempsey couldn't let that happen. He leaned in, his elbows on the table, and held Mun's gaze. I know you have questions, and I'm going to answer them as best I can, but first, he said, and it hurt to have to say it, I need you to call me Dempsey. I know that's hard. It's even harder for me. He realized, as he spoke, that it wasn't as hard as it used to be. In some ways, he barely remembered Jack Kemper, the man he'd been when Munn last saw him. Call me John, or Dempsey, or J.D., but Jack Kemper is dead. So, you're a full-fledged fucking Jones now, is that it? Munn asked. The words stung. As seals, they both had shared a disdain for the spooks who breezed in with their fake names and half-truths and jacked up their Tier 1 operations. But then Jarvis had pulled back the curtains and let him look at the big picture that had been obscured from him his entire career as an operator. Dempsey shrugged. Yeah, I guess I am, he said. But John Dempsey knows things that Jack Kemper never did. The world don't work the way we thought it did in the teams. Ah, fuck that bullshit. They got you brainwashed, Kemp. It's Dempsey and no, Dan, they don't. We both felt it before, but we chose to ignore it. Life is easier in black and white. Gray is fucking hard. Besides, do you really think that the people pulling the strings are morons? They're not. That's the lie we tell ourselves. It makes us feel better about our notch on the totem pole. At Ember, we can accomplish more in one week to neutralize the threat than we could have accomplished with a whole deployment back in the day. And you work for Jarvis? Mon asked, his tone finally taking on a conciliatory note. Dempsey leaned back and crossed his legs. Yep. That would go a long way with Mun. It had with him. Hell, it would with anyone who had ever served under Captain Kelso Jarvis, the legendary SEAL officer and Tier 1 operator. Munn shook his head. I knew Jarvis wasn't just saying hi that day in the hospital in Tampa when you were recovering from spine surgery. He was recruiting you even then, huh? The conversation stopped as the waitress walked up carrying their breakfast. As she set the two steaming egg scrambles down in front of them and left, Dempsey let his mind drift back to that day in the hospital. The memory was foggy now, like a fading dream. Had Jarvis been recruiting him? The skipper had given him a card that day, but he'd been on pain meds, and the nuance of the exchange was probably lost on him. I don't know, he said. I suppose he might have been recruiting me for the future. At that time, Ember didn't even exist. It rose from the ashes of Yemen and Djibouti, the tragedy that was Operation Crusader. I was the only one left alive from our unit to recruit. So what do you... what does this ember need from me? Mon asked. I think... We need each other, Dan, Dempsey said. Mon raised an eyebrow but said nothing. I need you to help grow and develop my team. I need you to round out what is becoming the best frontline defense against the universe of threats trying to bring our country to its knees. Mostly, I need you to help me finish what I started. To help me bury the last of the assholes who murdered our brothers. He could tell that his words resonated with Mun, who nodded and straightened a bit in his chair. And what is it that I supposedly need from you? A reason to get out of bed in the morning, Dempsey replied. Mon nodded. He didn't even try to argue this time. So I would be the medical support for your operational unit in this, this ember thing? No, Dempsey said, shaking his head. Your surgical skills and trauma experience will be invaluable, obviously, as will your scientific mind. Baldwin will love you, by the way he said with a chuckle. Who's Baldwin? We'll get to that if you decide to move forward. 
Dempsey said, holding up a hand. We are an insanely small task force and don't have the luxury of having anyone just hanging out in case someone gets hurt, so no. I'm recruiting you for something above and beyond med support. We need your skills as an operator and your mind as a tactician every bit as much as we need your surgical skills. Munn took that in as Dempsey's thoughts drifted back to the terrorist attack in the Old Town Market in Omaha six months ago. Dan Munn, the combat surgeon, would have been the perfect teammate at his side that day. Yes, the future held an unlimited number of prospects for a man like Munn. Wait, I would function as an operator? Dempsey nodded. Operator, field medic, tech guru, intelligence analyst, spy. Everyone on the team cross trains to wear multiple hats. I don't know, dude, Munn said with a sigh. In case you've forgotten, it's been a while since I kitted up. This body ain't the same one I took down range back in the day. I'm fucking old, bro. Nah. Old is a state of mind. Look at me. Yeah, look at you, Munn said and laughed. You're 40, right? 30 fucking nine, thank you very much, Dempsey growled. And I'm in peak physical condition. For a man my age. They were both laughing hard now. The waitress returned, tossing her hair and smiling. Can I get you beautiful men something harder to drink? A Bloody Mary, maybe? Dempsey smiled up at her. Just more coffee, he said, glancing at Munn to gauge just how strong the pull for alcohol may have become. Munn just nodded, lost in thought. She filled their mugs and left the brown plastic pot behind this time. What about oversight? Munn asked, leaning in, his voice enthusiastic and conspiratorial now. We work directly for Jarvis. And what paper-pushing pogue does he report to? Direct line to the Director of National Intelligence, Dempsey said. No red tape, no bullshit. Ember is off the grid. It's far more secret than even the Tier 1. There's no glass prison, no information blackout. We have the autonomy and the budget to get shit done. On time, on target. And you guys are hunting down the assholes who wiped out our brothers? Dempsey nodded. Among other things, yes. If it were up to him, they would do nothing else but hunt down the enemy who had killed their brothers, but that was not how it worked. Have you gotten any of them? Dempsey smiled broadly. Oh, yeah. And we recently bagged a blast from the past who killed another buddy of ours. Who? Romeo. Mon's eyes widened. You killed Mahmoud bin Jabbar? He said, clearly astonished. After all these years? When we found him, he was using a different name and fighting under the ISIS flag, but we bagged him and his friends, disrupting a massive terror attack here in the States. That shit in Nebraska and Atlanta? That was you guys? They said it was an FBI task force. That's our M.O., he said. It's just like the old days in the Tier 1. We can't take credit for shit we do since Ember doesn't exist, right? Right, Munn said, nodding. He locked eyes with Dempsey. Okay, count me in. What now? Dempsey took a deep breath and then said, Before we get on the plane, I need you to be sure. There's no going back from Task Force Ember. I can't read you in unless you're all in. I work at a VD clinic, remember? There's nothing here to go back to. The seal-turned surgeon held out his hand, and Dempsey grasped it. You're sure? One hundred percent, Mon said. I'm in, Mr. Dempsey. All in. This is Audible. Blackstone Audio presents Dempsey by Brian Andrews and Jeffrey Wilson. This book is read by Ray Porter. This is Audible. Brilliance Audio presents Red Spectre by Brian Andrews and Jeffrey Wilson. Performed by Ray Porter. For Gina.
Part 1 Your own prison you shall not make. The Code of Thieves, Vorovskoy Mir Chapter 1 Krinholmi Joala abandoned textile factory, Narva, Estonia, 500 feet from the Russian border, June 10th, 0400, local time. It's a trap, said the voice in his ear. Let's try not to jump to premature conclusions, John Dempsey replied as he piloted the silver Mercedes-Benz Sprinter around a tight fishhook turn. The panel van's tires grumbled in protest as he maneuvered off Kreenholme Street onto the pothole-ridden dirt and gravel stretch that led to an abandoned Estonian textile factory complex. Despite the early hour, the sun was already breaching the horizon, painting the Baltic sky with brilliant pink and orange hues. The city of Narva was north of the 59th parallel, putting it a degree north of Juneau, Alaska, in latitude. Thankfully, it was summer, and it didn't feel like he was operating in Alaska. Another SUV just pulled up and parked behind the building. That makes three vehicles... I'm telling you, you're walking into a trap, Elizabeth Grimes repeated with annoyed, persistent conviction. Grimes, the team's designated sniper, overwatch, and devil's advocate in residence, was communicating via the microtransmitter stuffed deep in his left ear canal. When he didn't respond, she sighed and added, This is one of your worst plans ever, you know that? Dempsey glanced at Dan Munn, who was riding in the back of the van. The former Navy SEAL and combat surgeon did a chatterbox impersonation with his right hand, his fingers and thumb forming a squawking bird beak. Munn and Dempsey had served together at the Tier 1 back in the day in what felt like another lifetime. At the teams, Dempsey had been a tool of the Joint Special Operations Command fulfilling a role as one of America's most lethal special operators. Now, he was a tactical spook, an operator playing dress-up and taking on the identity the mission du jour demanded. They named people like him Smith, Jones, or Johnson. In fact, John Dempsey wasn't even his real name, just the thing he called himself in this second incarnation of his life. As the head of Task Force Ember's Special Activities Division, the nation's best-kept counterterrorism secret, Dempsey was whoever America needed him to be to get the job done. Today, America needed him to be a scumbag bodyguard, and America needed Munn to pose as his boss, an even bigger scumbag international arms buyer. The pretext for the meeting was to inspect samples of the latest Russian weapons technology before placing a large order. The seller, Matvey Amarov, was one of Russia's most powerful mafia bosses, known for his ruthless practices and propensity for extreme violence. But it was all good. This was just another day at the office catfishing the most dangerous, sadistic, and vile players in the world's criminal and terrorist underground. Munn flashed Dempsey a crooked grin and said, Dude, you know she's usually right. I know, but I'll never admit that, he whispered. Then, loud enough for Grimes to hear, he said, I appreciate your concern, Alpha, but these Vori guys are famously paranoid. I mean, how many guys could Amarov have possibly brought? Since you asked, let me tell you, said Ian Baldwin, Ember's SIGINT chief back in Virginia. There's the vehicle up front, which you see, but a second arrived at the same time and parked behind the north corner of the building. We hold one thermal signature in each vehicle, the drivers, and the two gentlemen standing out front to meet you. That makes four. There are four more signatures inside the building, who appear to be setting up equipment. For what it's worth, we observed them unload three crates from the second vehicle and carry them inside. They have one additional body on the roof and a tenth patrolling the perimeter. 
although this last fellow is presently urinating on the wall at the north corner. The third SUV that Alpha just reported is hidden from your line of sight and has five signatures inside. This is probably their QRF on standby in the unlikely scenario that the two of you decide, despite being dreadfully outnumbered, to pick a gunfight. What the hell? Munn said, shaking his head. Hemerov insisted that I come with a single bodyguard while he brings an army. Remind me why we agreed to follow the instructions of Russia's most ruthless Vore boss to the letter. Well, we didn't follow them to the letter, Dempsey said. We brought long gun Lizzie with us, which, if you consider her KIA average per engagement, probably gives us a slight edge. While I appreciate your faith in me, Bravo, keep in mind that long gun Lizzie is working with razor-thin margins, Grimes said from her sniper hide. A millimeter could mean the difference between covering your ass and accidentally putting you six feet under. Might want to remember that when you're testing out new nicknames for me. Grimes had been in position for an hour after making her infill on foot when it was still dark. Dempsey glanced toward the upper level of a squat building. He pictured her lying on a table or a stack of boxes, draped over the Heckler & Koch M110A1 sniper rifle she seemed to prefer lately. The HK was lighter than the bolt-action Remington and semi-automatic, which saved her precious time between shots. Her angle was good, but the building unfortunately offered her no height advantage. Dempsey pursed his lips as he slowed the van's approach to the south corner of their target building and contemplated the tactical picture Baldwin had just painted. It's a lot of guys, he thought before shrugging it off. Doesn't matter. If today's the day I get my ticket punched, so be it. I don't care. This had been his mantra ever since the disastrous mission in Tehran. It wasn't that he had nothing left to live for. On the contrary, his life was about as good as it could get for a 40-year-old door-kicker divorcee who was officially dead to the world. He had a job that challenged him and made a difference in the world, teammates he both liked and respected, and a purpose. But if he was being honest with himself, something he was getting better at with age, it was time to recognize that he was past his expiration date. How many more missions could he play Russian roulette and spin that cylinder before fate finally got sick of saving his grumpy old ass and just let the hammer strike put him in the ground? An uncomfortable quiet hung on the line and Dempsey suddenly got the distinct feeling that everyone was waiting on him to say something. I wouldn't overthink it, guys. They're just being careful. If they wanted to kill us, they could have done it with one well-placed sniper sequence on our approach. As long as we don't pick a fight, everything will go fine. I have a good feeling about this meet. The last statement wasn't true, but Dempsey said it anyway. Alpha, how are your lines? Munn asked Grimes, his own misgivings clearly not assuaged by Dempsey's good feeling. I have easy lines on their roving patrol and the guy on the roof, but I'm no help once you go inside, Grimes answered. Unless all their shooters decide to hang out by the windows, there's not a whole lot I can do. Step through that door and you're taking your lives out of my hands and placing them entirely in Amarov's. Dempsey nodded at the comment, despite the fact Grimes couldn't see him. He looked in the rearview mirror at the back seat. Mun, who normally was dressed and groomed like a lumberjack, was fresh-shaven, his hair slicked back and dyed for the role he was playing today. "'What's your gut saying?' Dempsey asked. "'My gut is saying I wish we had a Reaper in orbit with Hellfire missiles,' Mun said. "'I was very clear in the pre-op that orbiting an armed Reaper 500 feet from Russian airspace was liable to start an international incident—' "'We know,' Dempsey said, cutting Baldwin off. "'We're not blaming you.' He looked back at Mun. "'So do we fish or cut bait?' 
Even with you on the scar, we're still just two guys, and only one of us with a rifle. If things turn ugly, our only hope is to talk our way out. Shooting our way to freedom is probably a non-starter. Dempsey tapped his fingers on the steering wheel and looked at the desert tan Scar H model assault rifle leaning against the passenger seat beside him. Grimes and Munn were right. Once they got inside, the factory floor would be nothing but wide open space. They'd have no hides and no backup shooters to provide cover fire or watch their six. If the Vori surrounded them, they'd never survive. Whether they walked out alive or not came down to Amarov's motives and endgame. It wasn't surprising that Amarov had brought additional personnel, but more than a dozen? Amarov was a big fish in the Vori Sea. Geographically speaking, his operation was concentrated in the Baltics, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, with nearby St. Petersburg serving as his home and Klaipeda as his logistical hub. When Ember's operations officer, Simon Adamo, discovered that Amarov had a history of transactions with a Chechen arms dealer and human trafficker named Malik, Dempsey had pushed aggressively for a meet-and-greet. It was Malik who had orchestrated last month's murder of the American ambassador to Turkey and kidnapped the ambassador's chief of staff, Amanda Allen. It was Malik who had tortured Allen while holding her hostage in Syria. It was Malik who had arranged for an assassination attempt on the President of the United States and the Director of National Intelligence. And finally, it was Malik who had shot Munn in the neck, nearly killing Dempsey's best friend, and then slipped through Dempsey's fingers after a harrowing chase through the streets of Istanbul. Malik had smarts and skills— and he was one of the most dangerous adversaries Dempsey had faced in his long and decorated career. Everyone in Ember and all the way up the chain of command to President Warner himself wanted this guy found. The problem was, since Istanbul, Malik had been a ghost. So Adamo had decided to change tack. If they couldn't find Malik, then they would try to develop a relationship with someone who would know where to look. Dempsey prayed Amarov would be that asset, but first they had to establish trust and confidence. Omega, any chatter we should know about? He asked Baldwin. Nothing of concern, Bravo, Baldwin said. Just personnel positioning instructions, nothing to indicate your knock is compromised. I still vote we abort, Bravo, Grimes said, her voice soft but insistent. We should reschedule this meeting on neutral ground, or at least somewhere we can bring a bigger team. Dempsey gritted his teeth. She made a good point, but what if this was the only shot Amarov was willing to give them? The Russian had been adamant about meeting at this derelict factory, only a stone's throw from the Russian border. If they burned this opportunity with Amarov, who would they try next? How long would it delay the search for Malik? Dempsey eased the van to a stop five meters from where two of Amarov's armed thugs stood waiting outside the south building. His gaze fixed out the windshield. He said, Amarov is the only vetted and viable lead we have. We don't have a fallback option. If we want to find Malik, I think our only choice is to see this through. Check. Grimes said, her tone resigned, but full of disapproval. Dempsey looked over his shoulder and locked eyes with Munn, who was stroking his chin. Munn nodded. Let's get it on. Dempsey swept his gaze across the scene one last time, then grabbed the scar and stepped out of the van. He closed the driver's side door and walked around to open the rear door for his boss, an international arms dealer known in the underground simply as The American. Munn was dressed in black jeans and black ostrich cowboy boots, and a silver chain hung around his neck. The black silk shirt he wore perfectly concealed the low-profile body armor beneath, a polished chrome Beretta 92G Elite with a pearl handle, of course, 
was on display in a black leather shoulder rig, and he clutched a steel briefcase in his left hand. He looked ridiculous. Munn took a deep breath, stepped out, and combed his slicked back hair with ring-covered fingers. With a scowl on his face, he cleared his throat and spat a loogie on the dusty gravel next to his boot. The American was a knock carefully curated and used by the CIA over the years. Langley had been adamant that the officer currently living the legend participate in the op, but the DNI had pulled rank, and now here they were. The two waiting Russians approached, both holding state-of-the-art AK-12 assault rifles pointing up at a forty-five, but firmly in two-handed grips. Two new guys emerged from the building fifteen meters away, cradling compact machine pistols. Dempsey clutched his own assault rifle in a combat carry, ready to put it on target, while Munn walked with unbridled swagger, the pistol under his left armpit no more help than if it had been left in the van. One of the Russians let go of his forward grip and raised his hand, either in greeting or as a gesture for them to stop, his intention unclear. Munn stopped and looked the two thugs up and down. The bigger of the two Russians muttered something to his comrade, and they both laughed. Baldwin translated in their ears. He said, Oh, look, it's the American and his doggy. Munn looked sideways at Dempsey, who raised his rifle, pointing it directly at the man's head. Munn then hollered back the only phrases in Russian he knew. He just told them to speak English and show respect, Baldwin translated, although Dempsey knew this one because... He'd listened to Mun practice it at least 150 times. The Vori enforcer's grin disappeared, and he raised both hands casually, though his eyes still flickered with a malicious fire. Of course, of course, he said with a thick Russian accent. We are meaning no offense, Mr. Amarov is excited to meeting the American. You are well known to us, and we are delighting to doing business. We are all sane here. Somehow I doubt that, Dempsey said under his breath, stepping a half pace ahead of Munn, but not lowering his rifle. He noted the sleeve of ornate Vori tattoos on the enforcer's forearms. All right, are we just going to stand outside pointing guns at each other, or are we going to do business? Munn said in the relaxed, unflappable voice of a man who'd participated in a hundred armed standoffs like this and walked away from all of them. Yes, of course, but your bodyguard is very serious. Perhaps if he's to aiming his rifle away from my face, the Russian said. Munn nodded at Dempsey, and Dempsey lowered his rifle, pointing it at the ground between them. "'Where's Amarov?' Munn demanded. "'It was agreed we meet in person. I do not negotiate with intermediaries. My time is too valuable to deal with minions.' The man laughed and commented in Russian to his colleague, who responded with a series of shoulder-shaking grunts. Aldi laughs not out of disrespect. He loves American movie about the minions. When Munn remained stern, the Russian said, I assuring you we are being more than minions. You are to be working closely with Aldi and me if moving forward with our product. My name is Track. We are... How do you say, managers for distribution in these region? Unacceptable. Where is Amarov? Amarov is inside building, Track said, and reached inside the flap of his coat. Dempsey raised his rifle and pointed at center mass as the Russian's hand came out to reveal a mobile phone. Gdenachotizia doveri. Where is trust? he said through a laugh and snapped a picture of them. 
Omega, Alpha, Amarov's guys just took Bravo's picture, Grimes reported back to the Ember talk, her voice tense. If they have an image database on the American, we're fucked. What are you doing? Mon asked, his gaze locked on track. Before meeting Amarov, we make sure you are who you say, Thrak said. It's normal procedure. Dempsey's throat tightened, time shifted into slow motion, and his senses kicked into that hyper-aware perceptual state he experienced whenever death was about to join the party. Someone inside the building is making a call, Baldwin reported. Bravo, this is Omega Actual, came a voice over the comms circuit. Shane Smith, Ember's director. I don't like it. I'm calling it. Mission abort, Bravo. It's time to start talking your way out of there. If this thing deteriorates on us, it's going to get real ugly, real fast. Dempsey glanced up at the roofline of the building and spied the barrel of the Russian sniper's rifle pointed down at them. Movement to his left caught his attention, and he saw the driver of the Vori SUV parked on their side of the building step out of the vehicle. The driver was holding an AK-12 and took up a firing position, using the hood to support his elbow. Aldi and Track still held their weapons in casual carries, and the two thugs guarding the door to the building behind them were still at combat ready, but not sighting in. Grimes was good, but between the Vori sniper, the driver with a bead on them, and the four other shooters outside, the odds of escaping without being shot were low. Dempsey looked at Munn, who, despite the confidence he was projecting, had worried eyes. Hey, boss, we don't need this shit. I say we hit the road. These guys clearly aren't interested in your business. Before Munn could respond to Dempsey's prompt, Track said, Good news. Mr. Amarov has agreed to see you. Then flashing them a vulpine grin, the Russian added, We have demonstration to be showing you inside. Then you'll be taking your sample weapons and leave us your deposit, yes? That is good news, Munn said, his voice hard. Why don't you invite Mr. Amarov to join us outside? We can shake hands, breathe the fresh air, and look at the merchandise out here in the light. No, no, I am sorry, but we cannot do these things under watchful eyes from satellites overhead. American CIA and the Russian FSB might both be looking down on us. Bad for everyone's business, you agree? Come inside, and we are having vodka, a show, and all will be well. You must be trusting us. That's a problem. I can't trust you. We agreed to come as two, but you have brought many. Munn said, gesturing to all the Vori shooters. Mr. Amarov clearly doesn't trust me, or he wouldn't be hiding inside the warehouse. So you tell your boss that if he wants my million-dollar deposit, he said, lifting the steel case and tapping it with his right hand. He can come out here, apologize to my face, and tell all the men with guns pointed at my head to lower their weapons. A strange expression washed over Track's face, and in that moment everything clicked in Dempsey's head. This wasn't a meet and greet, and it wasn't about the money. This was a snatch and grab, and he and Munn were the targets. That's why Amarov had picked a location so close to the Russian border, and why he'd brought so many men and vehicles. If Malik had made the same one degree of separation deduction as Adamo, suspecting that this meeting was a covert operation to use Amarov to get to him, then it stood to reason that he would direct Amarov to take preemptive measures. Malik had seen both their faces in Istanbul, and Track had just taken their pictures. After getting confirmation, all Amarov had to do was force them into a vehicle at gunpoint, and five minutes later they'd be in Russia, never to be seen or heard from again. Grimes was right. They had walked into a trap. Dempsey leaned into his shooting stance, pressing the stock of the Scar H firmly to his cheek, while putting the floating red dot of his holocyte in the center of Track's chest. Simultaneously, Munn drew the Beretta from its holster, 
and aimed at the big Russian's head. In that moment, their minds were one. All the missions they'd run together, all the ops they'd planned, all the evil bastards they'd hunted in the suck together had synchronized their thoughts. Munn had experienced the same epiphany as Dempsey, and Dempsey knew the next line out of his teammate's mouth before Munn said it. Your shooters will get one of us, maybe both, Munn said with stone-cold certainty, but not before one of us ends you. Gravel crunched underfoot as they took a cautious and synchronized step backward toward their van.
water to the west toward the shoreline. The swim took only 20 minutes, and they maintained a shallow approach depth of 15 feet for the duration of the infill. At the 50-yard mark from the beach, they surfaced, scanned the shoreline for threats, then, not seeing any, submerged for the final push. Upon reaching the surf, Riker and Saw took the lead, rising slowly above the surface, weapons at the ready. With the duo providing cover protection, the rest of the team stripped off fins and doffed masks and rebreathers in exchange for their tactical helmets with full-color X-27 NVGs. The SEALs dropped their dive gear beside Riker and Saw while Chunk scanned the beach through his Romeo 4 holographic sight, augmented by the Vortex VMX-3T behind it on the top rail. Chunk led Trip and Ant-Man out of the surf, fanning out and scanning sectors from the beach. A hand over Chunk's head indicated it was safe to advance, so Riker and Saw doffed their diver gear. With all the gear snapped into nice, compact units, Trip and Ant-Man concealed them among rocks, forming a jetty, covering them with sand and seaweed. Chunk took a knee while Saw scanned north and east, using the more powerful optics on his sniper rifle. Clear, Saw whispered beside him a moment later. Chunk signaled to the rest of the team, who seconds later spread out in a semicircle beside them. After scanning their sectors for threats and finding none, Chunk checked in. Home plate, Blackbeard 1, Chunk whispered into his boom mic. Alpha is tequila, sit rep. Roger, Alpha is tequila, the newly minted Chief Michelle Yi, Gold's Intel LCPO, replied in his headset, transmitting from her talk, which was located at an undisclosed location. Be advised, Bravo called tequila and is standing to infill on your mark. Check. He led his five-man element swiftly along the beach side of the perimeter road to a blue king cab pickup truck and white full-sized van. Chunk checked the windshield, confirming the stickers of the Taiwan Air Force, ironically known as the Republic of China Air Force, were secured in the correct location. Van's unlocked, Riker said and pulled the slider door open and all five of them jumped into the rear cargo compartment. Once inside, they stripped off kits and wetsuits, then quickly donned civilian clothes. They swapped out their headsets for wireless earbuds and tucked pistols into their waistbands. Then, with a wry grin, Riker handed each squad member a SEAL Team 2 ball cap to put on. Next, they backed their kits, helmets, and rifles into oversized packs and zipped them shut. Let's go, Chunk said, grabbing his bag and climbing out of the van with Riker to hop in the pickup truck. Saw took the driver's seat of the van while Ant-Man and Trip remained in the cargo compartment. Alpha is gin, Chunk called as he pulled away, leading the van along the road. Bravo is go for infill. Roger, Blackbeard, he replied. Bravo, you are go for infill. Bravo, Spence answered from the beach to the north at the most tactically advantageous infiltration location for the operation. Bravo Squadron would present the Taiwanese security forces with the exact breach scenario they expected, while Alpha Squadron caught them completely off guard with their pants down. It was a complicated and risky assault, but Chunk couldn't wait to see if it worked as planned. He looped the truck around the perimeter road and headed north past the entrance to the commercial side of the dual-purpose airport before eventually turning west. Five minutes later, they passed the base's massive fuel farm and turned onto the access road that led to the main gate on the military side of the airfield. Upon reaching the security checkpoint, Chunk braked to a stop and rolled down his window to greet a Republic of China Air Force security guard, fully kitted up in battle rattle with an assault rifle on his chest. When the sentry approached the vehicle, Chunk smiled and passed the security force soldier a common access card. The guard scanned the ID, then compared the picture to Chunk's face. Satisfied, the guard repeated the exercise with Riker's cack. Where are you headed, sir? The airman asked in heavily accented but clear English. The special operations compound, we're with Team 2. Your supervisor probably briefed you on the joint training we're conducting here on base. I know you will be here for two more weeks. That's right, Chunk said slipping his cack into his pocket. The van behind us is with us too, by the way. Yes, but I still have to scan them. Of course, Chunk said. Just giving you a heads up. 
The man gave them one more close look, then handed Riker's ID back and nodded to his fellow security operator inside the small but modern security shack. The steel barricades lowered into the ground and the bar rose. Chunk pulled the truck through and waited while the guard checked IDs for his guys in the van. Moments later, they were driving on the main road circling around the north end of runway 2103. This transit was the crucial point in the operation. If they were detected here, heading around the west side of the runway instead of running south on the main road toward the SOF compound, a small base inside the base, then Spence's plan was over. They had a plan B, of course, but it would be a running gun battle against a talented and numerically superior force of enemy special forces and base security that would likely not end well. Home plate, Blackbeard 1, sit rep, he said. The pause on the radio was longer than Chunk would have liked. Blackbeard, home plate, satellite imagery shows base security has detected Bravo Element and is mobilizing a defensive assault. We hold two groups of 12 leaving the SOF compound and heading toward Bravo. Also, the security forces are mobilizing to the perimeter road south in Humvees. Looks like it worked. You should have minimal resistance at the alert hangars. Chunk looked over at Riker and raised his eyebrows twice in his best Magnum P.I. imitation. Better to be lucky than good, Riker said with a grin. With Saw in the van following behind, Chunk accelerated and headed for the section of the base with the alert fighter wing. They passed a stone signpost with a placard displaying six overlapping blue circles beneath the wings and head of a bird, a sword laying atop, and the Roman numeral 5 below. Chinese symbols were displayed along with 5th TFW beneath the logo. He navigated his way to a practically deserted parking lot that serviced alert hangars 1 through 4. Saw, however, kept driving. He would drop Trip and Ant-Man by a second set of four alert hangars clustered at the south end of the field, then park at the service building where he would set up an overwatch. Looks clear. Riker said, scanning through the windows and clearly itching to get kitted up and moving. Agreed, let's go. Chunk exited the vehicle, slung a large gray backpack over his right shoulder, and followed Riker out of the parking lot and into a stretch of woods that served as a buffer between the runway and the perimeter of the base. In cover, they quickly kitted up. Chunk unzipped his backpack and pulled his heavy vest over his head. Then he pulled out his helmet and NVGs and slipped them on his head. He snapped the dual night vision tubes into place, the blackness of the woods disappearing, replaced by a full-color, near-daylight view of their surroundings in the new generation NVGs. He glanced at Riker, who gave him a thumbs up. They scanned right and left for threats, and finding none, Chunk chopped a hand toward the first concealed alert hangar. The two seals moved like shadows, legs churning in a tactical crouch, as they arced around the base of the earthen mound housing and concealing a fighter plane. Unlike most hangars, these hangars were built into the earth, with turf and trees growing atop the dome-shaped mound that completely concealed the structure when viewed from above by satellite or reconnaissance aircraft. The massive hangar doors were kept open so the jets could taxi straight out of the mouth of the hangars and onto the concrete skirt that connected to the runway. Riker paused at the entrance, took a knee, and held up two fingers. Chunk scanned inside the entrance and saw two sentries, posted on either side of the wide opening. Beyond his sightline and deeper inside the hangar, Chunk knew two F-16s, or F-5Fs, waited fully loaded on alert, the flight crew in quarters with their crew chief dressed and ready to go. The stealth of the cave-like design in Chunk's mind was outweighed by the vulnerability of the tunnel entrance. To neuter the base's air defense response, they didn't need to destroy the jets. Carefully placed charges at the entrance would trap the jets and pilots inside a tunnel of rubble. He nodded at Riker, pointed to himself, then chopped a hand south. I'll circle around and take the guy on the left. Riker nodded. Keeping low, Chunk sprinted up and over the mound to get to the opposite side. He took a knee at the edge of the brush line, a short four-foot drop to where the ramp tapered down from the entrance. One set, he whispered, his voice carried to his teammate on their secure channel. My count, Rikers whispered, his augmented voice crystal clear in Chunk's left ear. Three, 
two, one. On the cadence of zero, Chunk dropped from the hill onto the cement and charged the hangar entrance in a low combat crouch, sighting through his holographic red dot sight. He set the red dot on the chest of the fully kitted up sentry and squeezed the trigger twice, the suppressed rifle burping quietly. Two red splotches appeared on the Taiwanese guard's chest and he stumbled backward. He stared at Chunk for a moment in disbelief, then resignation washed over his face as he touched the wet red paint on the left side of his chest. Defeated, the sentry dropped to the ground where he lay quiet and unmoving, simulating death. On the opposite side of the hangar, the other sentry was similarly felled by Riker's surprise attack. Chunk covered the entrance from the shadows while Riker got to work pulling charges from his kit and setting them into the walls on either side of the tunnel. The entire evolution took less than two minutes before Riker was back at Chunk's side. Hangar one neutralized, Riker whispered. Three to go. Hangar eight neutralized, Tripp said, chiming in. Fifty bucks says we finish our four first. You're on, Riker said. Opposing forces engaging Bravo element, Yi announced in Chunk's ear. He heard the head shake in her voice. They'd gambled and won again, despite her skeptical analysis of their chances. Estimate Bravo will be out of the fight in five minutes. Oh, ye of little faith, came Spence's reply. We're not dying that easy. If you die, I'm asking your sister out, Tripp said, unable to resist the jab. You do, and I'll haunt you from the grave. Five is now God, Saw's voice announced, ending the banter. Speed had necessitated the Chunk and Alpha Squadron get right to work rather than waiting for their sniper to achieve an overlooked position, but it felt good knowing Saw was there. He and Riker advanced on the second hangar and repeated the evolution, killing the guards and setting charges. Rinse and repeat two more times, and he called it in. Home plate one, hangar four is neutralized, he said. Copy one, came Yee's reply. One, three, hangars five through eight neutralized, Trip reported, with just the right amount of irritation that he and Ant-Man had been beaten by the two old guys in the platoon. Home plate, Blackbeard is scotch, Chunk announced, indicating all the hangar charges were set and this phase of the infiltration was done. But they had to work fast now. On the east side of the joint airfield were plenty more ROCAF F-16s and F-5s, but at this hour they were unmanned, unarmed, and with no support personnel present. Disabling the alert fighters achieved the primary objective, but the mission also called for taking of the control tower and the tactical air defense building. Without achieving that, the C-17s could not drop rangers onto the field to gain full control. With only four shooters in Alpha Squadron, taking the tower and TAD building by force would be mission impossible. But they didn't need to take control to win. So long as the tower and TAD building went dark, they could achieve the desired outcome. Loss of base radar, communications, and traffic control. Leg muscles on fire, Chunk and Riker sprinted across the tarmac toward the power transformer station, which was located at the north end of the alert fighter annex and fuel depot. Blue forces splitting, Blackbeard, Yi called, her voice tense now. They realize what's happened. We're so close, just need a few more minutes. Home plate, call the charges on the hangars, Chunk said, his order coming in punctuated words between huffs of breath. Roger, detonating, Yi said, and he could hear the grin in her voice. A second radio clipped to his kit, the one for monitoring the command and control overseeing the entire exercise, barked to life for the first time with Captain Bowman's imposing baritone voice. Red Cell detonates charges on alert hangars. All eight hangar tunnels destroyed. Aircraft and personnel out of the fight. Blackbeard, you have incoming defense forces in trucks heading straight for your paws, Yi said, her voice tense. How long do we have? Chunk said, scanning for the incoming as they reached the chain-link fence around the transformer station. Ninety seconds. Chunk knitted his fingers together to make a foot sling and crouched beside the fence. Riker, having played this game a hundred times, stepped into it and leaped as Chunk boosted him up and over the fence. The seal rolled over the top and landed with a heavy thud on the other side. Chunk whirled, took cover behind a metal box, 
and sighted over his rifle at the incoming Defender SUVs, which he could see, and hear, screaming toward them. "'Work faster!' Chunk yelled over his shoulder. "'Going as fast as I can!' Riker called back as he placed and set the charges. The two inbound SUVs screeched to mirror-image fishtailing stops and blue shooters jumped into covered positions. Marker rounds sailed in both directions and Chunk unleashed covering rounds as the blue shooters returned fire. Home plate, Blackbeard is rum, Riker announced for them both, indicating the charges were set on the power station. Home plate, one, call charges on relay. Red cell destroys power relay. Bowman announced on the command and control channel. All power down to base. Sniper executes blue shooters engaging Blackbeard at the power transformer station, Saw reported on the comms channel, and the blue shooters who had been firing at Chunk and Riker went down. With a victory adrenaline high, Chunk waited for Riker to hop the fence and rejoin him. Then they jogged southeast to where they joined Ant-Man and Trips. The head shed would be calling it any minute now, Chunk figured, but if not, Alpha could try to take the tad. Team 2 is going to be so pissed, Riker said, grinning as they ran like teenagers who had just pulled off a high school senior prank. You know they'll say we cheated, Tripp said on their comms channel. But if you ain't cheating, you ain't trying, Chunk said, quoting the familiar NSW mantra. Red Cell secures Air Defense Center, Rangers inbound, 10 mics. Then, on the Red Cell channel, Bowman said, Red Cell operational success. Base defense is secure. All personnel secure from exercise. Gold Platoon return to Hangar 5 ahead of next phase. Team 2 SDV drivers return the SDVs to the Ohio. We won, Riker said with a grin and clapped Chunk on the shoulder. We always win, Chunk said, nodding. We're the Tier 1.
Everybody knows Abe has an Irish temper, Solomon said. But I can't imagine it came to blows. She made a note. Project Nomad equals spark that burned the house down. Look, detective, what you need to understand about Abe and Britt is that they both have larger-than-life personalities. Solomon stopped and pinched the skin above the bridge of his nose. Had. Damn it. I keep doing that. It's just so strange. We had lunch plans for tomorrow, for Christ's sake. I know it's difficult, she said. Do you need a moment? Solomon shook his head. Everybody wants to try to compare Brit and Abe to Jobs and Wozniak. Everyone assumes that because Brit is CEO, he must be the one with the charisma and the vision, and Abe is the reclusive genius working behind the scenes, but nothing could be further from the truth. They're both visionaries, and they are both reclusive geniuses when they're out of the spotlight. He paused and took a deep breath before continuing. She could see his eyes were beginning to rim with tears. Do you know how they decided who was going to be CEO of the company? She shook her head. With a coin flip, he said with a chuckle. And do you want to know how I know that? Because I'm the one who flipped the coin. I mean, can you imagine that? A coin flip to decide something as critical as who gets to be CEO of Platform Cognition. After letting that sink in for a moment, Valerie looked at her notepad. She'd filled three pages with notes, and her hand was starting to cramp. Thank you, Mr. Solomon, for both your time and your candor. I know this is a difficult time. Solomon nodded, struggling to keep it together. If you don't mind, could you point me in Miss Cahill's direction? Of course, he said. They both stood and shook hands, and she followed into the hallway as Solomon escorted her to the office two doors down from his. The placard on the door read Jennifer Cahill, CFO. A young woman smiled at them as they entered the outer office. Solomon smiled back and nodded, then headed past the receptionist's desk to rap on the door to the main office with a single extended knuckle. He peered through the glass side light, and Valerie looked around his shoulder into the office. A woman looked up from her computer, her face contorted with annoyance. Solomon cracked the door open. Jennifer, this is Detective Marks. She's investigating what happened to Britt. We just finished talking, and she was hoping you could squeeze her in for a few questions. Cahill pursed her lips. I don't have time for this shit, Derek. You don't have time to talk to the homicide detective investigating the founder of this company's death, Solomon said, a hard edge coming to his voice. Are you kidding me? Fine. I'll give her five minutes. Solomon looked at Valerie with apologetic eyes. Nice to meet you, detective, he said. If you have any more questions, feel free to contact me. I'm available anytime. Valerie thanked him and turned to face Platform Cognition's CFO. I don't have all day, detective. Are you coming in or not? Cahill said, her eyes already back on her computer fingers typing as she talked. Valerie suppressed a wry smile as she stepped across the threshold and thought to herself, well, this ought to be interesting. Chapter 5 Project Nomad Lab Space Third Floor Platform Cognition The lab smelled of copper, injection-molded plastic, and stale coffee. Kimberly Knowles inhaled deeply as she meandered the rows of workstations. In the digital age, olfaction was the ugly stepsister of the five senses. But this particular scent, one she had once associated with defeat, had taken on a new and comforting association. Anticipation. Her colleagues in the lab, orphaned foot soldiers from the recently scuttled Project Nomad team, clicked away at their keyboards, eyes glued to monitors, ears enveloped in headphones. They were the best and brightest coders employed at Platform Cognition, and none of them had been fired or reassigned. The project was dead, and yet somehow it wasn't. 
Constituent components had been disassembled, and yet work progressed. Dr. McAllister had been vocal in her belief that Norris had made a mistake, and that his edict was a redirection rather than a termination. And so, everyone here, including Kimberly, still served the beast. The new guy looked up as she passed, a man-child who could not weigh more than 140 pounds. He flashed her an awkward grin, and she responded with a flirtatious smile and watched him blush, then slipped into her cubicle and dropped her bag on the floor. The coders worked crazy, disjointed hours, their performance measured in lines of code, rather than hours punched on the clock. More than half the team worked nights, and her row was vacant except for the new guy, two dividers away. She fired up the two computer monitors at her station and looked at her inbox. She ignored the handful of emails from her project teammates, knowing there should be nothing time-sensitive in her queue. She'd worked ahead, and all her deliverables had been met for the week. This didn't guarantee she'd be left alone, but the odds of an impromptu supervisor flyby were low. She leaned back in her chair, scanned the row. Empty. She ducked under her desk, where she unzipped the gym bag she'd set on the floor, and fished for her Gerber tool. Finding it, she opened the Phillips head screwdriver and removed the four screws that fixed the side panel to her partially hollowed out tower computer case. As she lifted off the side panel, a laugh from a nearby cubicle sent her heart rate galloping, and she froze, debating if she should abort. But then she recognized the laugh as belonging to Dr. McAllister, whose office was located on the far side of the lab. She exhaled and retrieved the first of three white plastic boxes. Each sealed box contained a brick of plastic explosive, with the detonator already embedded. Two wires with plug connectors extended from the ends of the boxes, which she plugged into female receptacles on a modified circuit board, anchored to a metal chassis she had built and tested at home over the last several nights. She snapped the connectors together and slid the first box into the chassis. She repeated the procedure for the other two white plastic bricks, and then carefully maneuvered the entire, fully mated bomb into the computer housing. Only it didn't fit. Oh, shit, she muttered, the staccato pulse in her head now beating in her temples. She tried realigning it, but it wouldn't budge. The white boxes stuck out past the edge of the chassis by only a millimeter or so, but it was enough. The mated unit was too tall for the opening. She tried angling it and pushing harder, but it still wouldn't go. She couldn't hear any laughter anymore. Panic washed over her. Sweat broke out across her forehead, and her breathing picked up. She folded the Phillips head screwdriver into her Gerber and flicked out the knife. With nervous fingers, she inserted the thin blade between the rim of the white box and the housing. She torqued the knife gently, prying upward with one hand and pushing the assembly with the other. It clicked past the lip and then slid into the housing with a satisfying clunk. Eyes closed, she let out a slow sigh of relief. She thought she heard footsteps, but it was hard to tell on the industrial gray carpet that lined the space. A bead of sweat trickled down her temple in front of her ear and chased down her neck. She quickly set the side panel back into place, swapped the blade for the screwdriver, and went to work installing the four little screws. What are you doing? A woman's voice said behind her. She looked up, her heart pounding in her chest, to see Dr. Beth McAllister looking down at her. Stupid screw fell out, she said, twisting the last screw into place. You know we can put in work orders for that sort of thing. Platform pays you far too much for you to be turning screws, McAllister said, but she was still smiling. Kimberly's gym bag was open. There were other things in there she didn't want McAllister catching a glimpse of. Sometimes it's just more efficient to do things myself, she said, getting up and into her chair and swiveling to place herself between the chief scientist and the bag. Some of us are grabbing lunch at the cafe. You want to join? McAllister said. Kimberly flashed her a wide, easy smile while ignoring the tickle of another bead of sweat. This one headed for her chin. I appreciate the offer, but I'm going to work through lunch. I have a doctor's appointment this afternoon. Okay, 
McAllister said and gave a little wave. I'll see you later then. She smiled and waved goodbye. Oh, you sure as hell will. But you're not gonna like it when you do. Chapter Six Office of Jennifer Cahill It was the way the woman typed, staccato, deliberate, and hard, that first caught Valerie's attention. She couldn't see the computer screen, so whether Platform Cognition's CFO was typing an email or drafting language for the next quarterly report was a mystery. But Valerie suspected the content was irrelevant. This was how Jennifer Cahill typed all the time, a drummer's march, an angry prelude to battle. Valerie waited for Cahill to look up. She didn't. Are you going to ask me any questions, or are you just going to sit there? Cahill said, still typing away. Valerie turned the page in her flip notebook to a clean sheet and wrote, Jennifer Cahill, CFO, aggressive and acerbic. First of all, Miss Cahill, let me offer my sincerest condolences, she said, trying to break the ice with this woman. Yeah, well, life goes on, doesn't it? Cahill said, eyes still fixed on her monitor. As usual, his timing couldn't be worse. By timing, you mean the timing of Dr. Norris's death? Valerie asked, almost not trusting her ears. I was serious when I said you had five minutes, detective. I have a company to run and the media to manage. I didn't realize you'd been appointed interim CEO. If not me, who else? You think Derek can helm this ship? Pfft, yeah, right. How long have you been with the company? Valerie asked wondering if the board had convened and made the decision, or if Cahill had taken the initiative on her own. If forced to wager, Valerie would put her money on the ladder. Eight years. Have you always been the CFO? It wasn't clear from your bio on the company website. They hired me as comptroller under the original CFO, Mark Bishop. He was a moron. It took two years before I convinced them that Mark needed to go. By them, I presume you mean Norris and Winter. Cahill looked up from her computer monitor for the first time and flashed Valerie a look like, of course I'm talking about Norris and Winter, you moron. How would you describe your working relationship with Dr. Norris? Valerie asked, revisiting the same line of questioning she'd used with Solomon. Professional, she said. What other kind is there? Did you consider him a friend? Britt doesn't do friendship. He's a software engineer. Was that supposed to be a joke? She jotted a note, adding combative and sarcastic to the list of words describing Cahill. In that case, professionally speaking, did you notice any changes in Dr. Norris's behavior recently? Detective Marks, do I look like a nanny to you? Excuse me? You heard me. I'm the CFO of Platform Cognition, not Britt Norris's nanny. Keeping track of his mood swings and temper tantrums is not in my job description. An upsurge of anger swept over Valerie. When she was a first lieutenant in CID, she'd worked briefly for an asshole colonel who behaved just like this woman. Colonel Blankenship. It had taken her a while, but eventually she'd figured out that people like Blankenship only respected uncompromising resolve that can be neither bullied nor bought. When the colonel barked at her, she started barking back. I find your belligerent and callous indifference both unprofessional and insensitive, she said, narrowing her eyes at the other woman. The CEO of this company was discovered dead in his home this morning, lying in a pool of his own blood. Maybe you don't care about him personally, but as the CFO, you have a fiduciary duty to take his death seriously. So why don't you do me the courtesy of stowing the bullshit attitude, getting off your computer for a moment, and answering my questions? Alternatively, I can drive you to the station in the back of a squad car and continue this conversation in a room with fewer distractions for you. The CFO stopped typing and looked Valerie straight in the eyes. Are you finished with your little lecture, detective? I don't know, Ms. Cahill. Are you finished playing games? Something resembling a smile spread across the woman's face. An almost imperceptible nod was the only concession Cahill made. She removed her hands from the keyboard and dropped them into her lap. 
Have you observed any noteworthy or sudden changes in Dr. Norris's behavior recently? Did he seem angry or depressed? Valerie asked. Cahill nodded. Over the last several months, he's been more anxious and quick to anger. The decision to cancel Project Nomad was a difficult one for him. The company made a considerable investment in the venture, both money and man hours. He sold the project to the board as the future of the company, with an exponential return on investment. Pulling the plug was not a decision without consequence. Britt Norris had many negative qualities, but being a bullshitter was never one of them. And so, everyone piled into the stock. Within five minutes of the news breaking, the stock took a 20% nosedive. Cahill closed her eyes and sighed. I expect the same when the news of Britt's death hits the wire today. Quite frankly, I'm surprised it hasn't leaked already. Are you going to make a statement? What the hell do you think I was working on when you interrupted me? Shouldn't that be your public affairs spokesperson's job? The only thing Becca Stein is good for is eye candy. You think we let her write the material she reads? Cahill laughed. We hired her for her tits and those Jennifer Lawrence lips. If she happens to be on your interview docket, scratch her off. During her onboarding, she thought that AI was shorthand for as if. Seriously, don't waste your time with her. Ignoring Cahill's digression, Valerie zeroed her aim. Did Dr. Norris have any enemies? Anyone who might want to do him physical harm? If you're asking me if I know people who disliked him, the answer is yes. If you're asking me if any of those same people would go so far as to murder him, then the answer is no. What about Abe Winter? Cahill snorted and then laughed loudly. <laughs> Abe? A murderer? No, never. I've heard Dr. Winter had an Irish temper. Would you agree that Winter can be hot-headed? The first genuine smile she'd seen from Cahill spread across the woman's face. <laughs> oh, yeah, Abe's got a temper, all right. This one time we were- She stopped abruptly. Never mind, it's not important. First crack in the armor. Cahill used to have a relationship with him. Were you and Dr. Winter previously romantically involved? Who told you that? Cahill snapped, her expression souring. I'm a woman, and a detective. Plus, I've been told I have a gift for reading people. You expect me to believe that, Cahill said. You're a professional mind reader, is that it? That's not what I said. Valerie choked back the vitriol she felt brewing. Her gift wasn't something to brag about. Just ask any of the men she'd dated who'd found her alluring enough to sleep with, but too unnerving and complicated to have a relationship with. Maybe you should quit the force and come to work for our chief counsel, Cahill said with a cynical smile. He's so dense, he can't even read emoji. We could use someone like you. God only knows what lawsuits are coming our way. I imagine every union in the country will sue us by the time our AI products are done revolutionizing the defense, transportation, commerce, finance, healthcare, and logistics industries. Hell, half the country will be unemployed in two decades. Is that an actual projection? Could the type of AI you're developing here really result in 50% unemployment? Cahill shrugged. Plus or minus? Plus or minus what? Twenty percent. Her mind's eye flashed to the protesters at the platform cognition main gate. AIs will steal your job. AI is heartless. Stop AI before it destroys us. A heavy silence hung in the room between them for a moment. If that was true, and if it was widely believed... There were now about a hundred million new suspects in Norris's murder. Valerie tabled the grim thought. She couldn't afford to lose the momentum she'd established. The second Cahill resumed typing, they were done. When was your relationship with Abe Winter? Valerie said quickly. Cahill sighed. I don't see how that's germane to your investigation. Dr. Norris and Dr. Winter were longtime friends, were they not? Some might say best friends. And they started and ran this company together for the past decade. Is it fair to say that Winter's contentious departure from the company over Project Nomad had a strong emotional impact on Britt Norris? Cahill leaned back, resigned, perhaps. 
The truth is, detective, that Britt never really appreciated how much of his day-to-day success, and the success of this company, was because of Abe. And Abe, being the type of man that he is, never wanted to undermine Britt's legitimacy, authority, or reputation by taking credit for achievements and accomplishments that were rightly his to claim. The minute Abe left, the wheels started falling off this bus. But everyone here has been drinking the Kool-Aid for so long, they're just now starting to recognize it. In your opinion, was Abe Winter the better choice to have been named CEO? Without question, she said definitively. And then, with a sneer, added, do you know how they decided who would be CEO between them? I heard they flipped a coin. It's true, they flipped a fucking coin. Can you imagine using heads or tails as the selection criteria for the CEO of a company with a hundred billion dollar market capitalization? They were like a couple of kids. But it didn't have a hundred billion dollar market cap back then. Success on that scale is not something you can chalk up to random chance. Cahill snorted with annoyance. He got lucky, and he had Abe Winter. For someone supposedly so brilliant, he sure made a lot of moronic decisions. There's that word again. Seems like everyone who works here is a moron, except her. Cahill was getting distracted. Valerie needed to put a stake in the ground before she lost the opportunity to ask the most important questions on her list. I know your time is valuable, Miss Cahill. Just a few more questions, then we can wrap up. Three more, and that's it. First question, go. The group of protesters out at the front gate that Abe is leading. You mean Ram? Is that what they call themselves? Yeah, Rage Against the Machine. Actually, that's a band. Technically, they're Rage Against Machines, Ram. They think they're so clever with the double entendre acronym. How radical is Ram? I understand they've engaged in nonviolent protests. But do you think that they're capable of using violence, or even escalating to terror, to promote their agenda? Ram is like so many of these fringe groups. They're all radicals, but some radicals are more prone to violence than others. When Abe is out there, the kids behave themselves. When he's not around, they tend to act up. Who knows what they're capable of without parental supervision? I told Britt we needed to completely overhaul our security protocols here, but would he listen? No. He wanted an open campus with butterfly gardens and unicorns. Which is why you don't have a security checkpoint at the entrance. Precisely, but don't worry. By the end of the week, that will change. I've already tasked our head of security to give me a comprehensive plan to overhaul every aspect of our security and monitoring program. What type of security do you have in place now? Cahill sighed. We have the front desk, one roving guard inside the building, one roving guard on the grounds. And the employee entrance to the garage has a guard shack with a gate and badge reader. Plus, we have security cameras and our platform cognition security AI monitoring system. Valerie nodded as she took notes. But you're going to ramp up. Our CEO was just murdered. What do you think? I never said he was murdered, Valerie said. You didn't have to. I'm not a moron, detective. And besides, even if Britt Norris was contemplating killing himself, he's too chicken shit to do the deed. Valerie swallowed her revulsion at the comment and looked down at her notes. Her gaze returned to the bold double arrow she'd drawn between Rage Against Machines and Abe Winter. Walk me through something, she said, tapping her pen against the page. Why would Abe Winter, co-founder of the world's leading AI company, join up with a radical group protesting the very entity he started? Cahill rolled her eyes. Why do rich, successful, middle-aged men do half the stupid shit they do? It's called a midlife crisis, detective. For men like Abe, this is not enough, she said, gesturing to everything around them. For men like Abe, it's not enough to be a billionaire. It's not enough to be an industry pioneer or a famous entrepreneur. To make the headlines today, you have to be all those things and have a social justice platform. Abe could have pulled a Bill Gates and formed a foundation to eradicate disease, or teamed up with Mackenzie Bezos to tackle homelessness. But no, Abe had to be a rebel crusader and publicly denounce AI as an existential threat to mankind. Then, for shock value, if you ask me, completely out of the blue, he shows up at a RAM protest. The minute he did that, he gave RAM instant legitimacy. 
Do you think Ram could have had anything to do with Britt Norris's death? I don't think Abe had anything to do with Britt's death. I can't speak to any of his radical acolytes. Who knows what some of those morons might be capable of? Just one more question. Was Dr. Norris involved with anyone romantically? Did he have a girlfriend or long-term partner you had occasion to meet? A curious smile spread across Cahill's face. Britt was incredibly private when it came to personal matters, almost bizarrely so. In all the time I've been here, and all the company events, I can only recall him bringing a date to a function on one occasion. It was memorable because she was a celebrity, Jessica Cole. I think it lasted a couple of months, and that was it. Never even made the tabloids. That's how secretive he was about his relationships. And there's no one else. Cahill shrugged. Just rumors. Rumors are often born from truth. Go on. There is this one girl, a coder we hired for Project Nomad, that supposedly Britt was fucking. What's her name? Kimberly Knowles, Cahill said with a sneer. Then, under her breath, added, little freak. You're not a fan, I take it? No, I'm not a fan. And why is that? Because this is a Fortune 500 company, not a free-the-nipple rally. I don't know what that means. It means that this may be a tech company, but that doesn't mean we don't have standards of professional conduct. Employees are expected to bathe, to wear clothes, and to wear bras under said clothes. If a female employee wants to spend her free time at the piercing and tattoo parlor, smoking weed and pretending she's some badass black hat, that's fine by me. But bring that attitude to work, and I take issue. She's a millennial, Valerie said with a shrug. I don't have a problem with millennials, detective, so long as they don't act like millennials. Valerie made a note to interview Kimberly Knowles. Anyone else you can think of who might be helpful to the investigation? No, Cahill said simply. Valerie closed her notebook and, with the most ingratiating smile she could muster, said, Thank you, Miss Cahill. I know this is a very busy and emotional time, so I appreciate you answering all my questions. I know I came off like a bitch there at first, but like I said, the timing of this whole thing could not be worse. I hope you catch the bastard who did this. I really do. You have my word on that. But I do have an important favor to ask. For the sake of information management, please do not speak with the media about the investigation. And in your press release, refrain from using the word murder, as we have not definitively ruled out anything. I understand, Cahill said. And since I'm drafting the statement as we speak, you can rest easy. Valerie stood. Cahill didn't, nor did she extend her hand. Valerie set her card on the corner of the desk and turned to leave. Cahill's eyes were already back on her computer monitor. Thank you, detective. I'll be sure to contact you if I think of anything else. Good day. Valerie walked out of Cahill's office and headed toward the fifth floor atrium, where the spiral escalator was located. What she learned about Cahill, spoken and unspoken, did not take the woman off the suspect list in Valerie's mind. But another part of her was already moving to the next name on the list. She paused at the railing and peered down the center of the donut hole opening to the lobby and checked her watch. She had time to conduct a couple more interviews before heading back to the scene to caucus with Sergeant Land and check in with forensics. Norris's body had been brutally savaged, and in doing so, the killer had undoubtedly left clues she'd overlooked. Her father had once told her that crimes of rage and passion always betrayed their masters, one way or another. Always. Chapter 7 Grove Avenue at North Mulberry Street, The Fan District, Richmond, Virginia Kimmy Knowles locked her car and headed toward her apartment, her mind racing. Only minutes after setting up her devices, she'd heard the news, spreading like wildfire, that Dr. Norris was dead, and that a detective was making the rounds to ask questions. Most were stunned and emotional, many openly weeping at the news. Kimmy felt only an increase in her own paranoia, because the news changed nothing for her except the risk. 
She'd often imagined his demise, but the timing could not be worse. She wasn't a skilled liar, and confessing the truth about her brief but steamy relationship with the murdered CEO would certainly make her a suspect. Getting detained, or God forbid arrested, would ruin her plans. She only needed to stall for another twelve hours, so making herself scarce was the simplest way to buy the time she needed. The wooden stairs creaked underfoot as she descended into the underworld of her other life. An apartment unit with a basement had been a requirement when she'd finally decided to ditch living with roommates and move out on her own last year. It had taken her a year of disciplined savings to pay off her credit card debt and meet the security deposit and rent obligations on an apartment. Now she had a place of her own, where she could do as she pleased without the stress of having to conceal her double life. She inhaled through her nose. The basement stayed dry despite the Virginia humidity, thanks to the three dehumidifiers she kept running. But a dank, musty smell lingered nonetheless. In the beginning, she'd hated the odor. Now she kind of liked it. She spent countless hours down in this dark hole, and in doing so, conditioned her brain to make an olfactory association between the smell and the cause. This type of pairing of the physical and the metaphysical was a distinctly biological phenomenon, something that would never happen with machine intelligence. Biologically driven imperatives motivated and drove the behavior of every species on this planet, including humans. Especially humans. What most failed to recognize was that behavior driven by biological imperatives would be confounding and meritless to machine intelligence. And this was why the two could never coexist. The burgeoning class of machine intelligence was as alien as extraterrestrials. In fact, humanity would have more in common with biological aliens from another planet than it would with the monstrosity born from Project Nomad. After all, she'd seen it. She'd interacted with it. And now she knew the truth. Machine intelligence was the single greatest threat to humankind ever encountered in the history of the species. And knowing that, she had a moral obligation to do something about it. Thankfully, she was not alone in this epiphany. Other contemplative programmers, computer scientists, philosophers, physicists, and even a few capitalists had recognized this as well. The most surprising being Abe Winter. And some of them, like her and Abe, were ready to do something about it. Someday the world would thank her for her sacrifice. She looked at her reflection in the darkened monitor at her workstation. Finally, she was doing something that was her calling, not a path laid out by her parents and their values. Kimmy loved her father, and if she was completely honest with herself, craved his approval and admiration more than anyone else's. To please him and her mother, she'd done things according to his plan. She'd studied hard in high school, taken her AP classes, and participated in a cross-section of respectable extracurricular activities, taken SAT prep courses and a college application prep course, and conducted hours of mock interviews with her dad. It had all paid off with acceptance letters from UVA and Georgetown. At her father's urging, she'd gone to the latter, and she'd majored in English, minored in journalism, and graduated cum laude, all according to plan. Until she couldn't get a job. Cum laude from Georgetown, and she couldn't get a fucking job. A mountain of student loan debt, and she couldn't get a fucking job. That wasn't how it was supposed to work, her father said. Was she making mistakes during her job interviews? She must have been. Nothing practice couldn't fix. Persistence, he said. Persistence was the key. But persistence was not the key. The world had changed in the decades since her father graduated from college. The world didn't need any more journalists, certainly not bad enough to pay them a salary. So at 23 years old, with a mountain of debt and a disappointed father, she applied to and was accepted at the Norris Coding Academy, an intensive, highly structured and rigorous six-month coding boot camp that claimed an 85% job placement upon graduation. While the top half of the class were siphoned away by Fortune 500 companies, the top 5% were invariably snatched up by platform cognition, Although Norris claimed his motives for founding the Academy were purely philanthropic, it was hard to overlook the cold fact that the Norris Coding Academy provided a convenient vehicle to vet and groom a bottomless talent pipeline for his company. She'd caught Norris's eye quickly, and been one of his early hires, but not entirely because of her coding. 
It was obvious from the beginning that the fling would never amount to a relationship, but Kimmy didn't care. She'd never fucked a billionaire before, and a brilliant one at that. She'd even agreed to let him film her with a 3D camera setup that made his bedroom look like a Hollywood movie set. She wasn't a moron. She knew what he was up to. If this ends up on Pornhub, I'll murder you, she said, deadly serious while grinding on top of him that first night. For my private use only, I assure you, he said. And it turned out he'd been telling the truth. She still used software to scan the web for her face regularly, and took active steps to minimize her online footprint. She'd ended things when the novelty wore off. He'd not fired her for rebuffing him, and his demeanor and professionalism at work were unchanged. Unlike most celebrity billionaires, Norris wasn't an egomaniacal narcissist. Instead, he learned how to separate his carnal machinations from the cognitive ones. Ironically, that's what she'd found attractive about him in the first place. But that was before her great awakening, before she realized that he and his creation were an existential threat to humanity. The microwave chimed, notifying her that her coffee was ready. The century-old row house was never designed to handle the heat generated by the six powerful computers she had presently working at maximum capacity, mining Bitcoin. And beads of sweat had already formed on her chest, trickling down between her breasts and soaking into the fabric of her tank top. She reached over and clicked on the small desktop fan. A cool breeze washed over her right side, washed over Prometheus. The tattoo covered her entire right flank, had cost her thousands of dollars, and had caused her significant pain, the administration of which became a powerful aphrodisiac. By the second session, it was obvious that the young artist, Ryan something or other, was hard for her. He wasn't shy about stealing glances at her exposed right breast as he worked, and the bulge in his pants was impossible to miss. During the final session, the burn of the needle under his command was so erotic she could barely lie still. When Prometheus was finished, they screwed like animals in the back room on a couch that smelled like beer and body odor, and her orgasm was mind-blowing. But it wasn't Ryan something who'd made her come. It was Prometheus. It was Prometheus who had entered her, joined with her. Now that she knew her enemy and had embraced him, she could endeavor to take the fire back before it was too late. The tattoo was her war paint. Promethean mythology was what drove Norris and the leadership at Platform Cognition. In their twisted minds, machine intelligence was the flame that would bring illumination to a dark and dismal world. But they misunderstood their gift. The fire they were offering humanity, once unleashed, could not be contained or extinguished. Machine intelligence was not a torch in the darkness. It will be our funeral pyre. She reached out and moved the mouse, waking the center monitor from sleep. The screen came up with a simple flashing green rectangle. She typed a few lines of code, and she was in the dark web, the homepage of her dark site opening like a flower from the center of the screen. She watched the banner unfold at the top like an ancient scroll, Rage Against Machines in Old English font. And then the single rose on a black background grew up from a pile of broken circuit boards. She tapped out a series of passwords that gave her administrative access to the chat room she ran. What had, a few short months ago, been a handful of messages at each login had grown exponentially. She was looking at nearly 2,000 messages since her last login, less than 48 hours ago. It was happening. She clicked the box and began to scroll through the message boards, which were on fire in the wake of Norris's death. Most messages were short and celebratory, but the rest were rally cries for more action, more violence and bloodshed if needed. She focused on these, wondering if Norris's killer was online right now, basking in the glory of the deed. She stopped at one from someone with the handle Natty Mike. Natty was slang in her circles for someone free of artificial man-made shit, though the irony of sending it through the sophisticated computer systems needed to access her site was not lost on her. We can't wait for the fucking government to stop this madness. By the time the assholes in Washington react, there will be a fucking clever bot in the White House, writing a constitutional robocracy for the anthro-PCs. Natty Mike. 
There were several replies, from benign to nonsensical, but toward the bottom she found this. If we, the enlightened, are unwilling to shed blood to protect our sovereignty, then all is lost. Those willing to risk our very existence for short-term corporate profits are enemies of the human race. If you believe this is anything other than war, you do not understand the stakes, nor do you understand our enemy. Refuse to risk a brave few, and risk us all. There must be blood. ARW 2314 she clicked on the replies box and read the quote from Shakespeare's Henry V. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers. For he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother. Be he ne'er so vile, this day shall gentle his condition. It is noble, I believe, to call for blood if needed. But know that it may be our blood that needs to be shed for this cause. Who is willing to form this band of brothers? The time to act is now. What about you, ARW2314? Do you have the courage to rise up and topple those who would see us undone? Crispin2023 She clicked on Crispin2023, and a private message box appeared. She began to type. Crispin2023, I admire your passion. If you are truly ready for battle, we need leaders like you to be the generals in our army. Those of us who understand the stakes must lead by example. The time has come to shed the blood of the enemy and their mindless acolytes. Time is short. The Antichrist is here, and it is no oracle, no genie, no sovereign. Any hope for a steward savior is lost. The clock is two seconds to midnight. If I fail in that which I'm about to endeavor, can I count on you to sound the bugle call? Can I count on you to plan and execute the next assault? Ram.